Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get into today's episode, let's talk about the brands that help make this possible. Today's episode is brought to you by Babbel. Now, for most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point in our academic careers. Now, thanks to Babbel, the number one selling language learning app, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or you just have some free time, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. I was prepping for a trip to Costa Rica, where they speak Espanol. What did I do? Logged on to Babbel to brush up a little bit. Babbel's 15-minute lessons, they make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. And unlike the infamous language classes we probably all took in high school, Babbel designs their courses with practical, real-world conversations in mind, things that you're going to use in everyday life. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be ridiculously effective. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Like I said, I was getting ready to go to Costa Rica, and I have some time going to and from town. So what did I do? A little bit in the car every day, and it certainly made a difference on the trip. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com and use the promo code Cleared Hot. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Cleared Hot for an extra three months free. Babbel, language for life. This episode is also brought to you by Kalo the makers of the original silicone ring. Kalo has mastered comfort, functionality, and style. Kalo rings are designed to be worn during all of your everyday activities, which makes them perfect for people who live an active lifestyle. The name Kalo itself stands for quality, athletics, love, and outdoors, something I didn't know until they reached out for sponsorship. And having said that, I actually wore these rings for, I think, at least five years, almost 10. I'm obviously not married now, but when I was, this was my go-to ring, and I first found them when athletes were wearing them at CrossFit competitions. Why were they wearing them? Well, the rings are designed to keep you safe from ring avulsion by breaking after exceeding a certain amount of uh, pressure. And if you have a little bit of time on your hands, Google that term and you're going to understand why you want to avoid it. It's ideal for firefighters, police, service members, mechanics, athletes, outdoor enthusiasts, people who travel, or military personnel, and a lot more. It's a great way to show your commitment to your spouse and family by wearing your ring during all of your everyday activities. And you can even customize your Kalo ring with a meaningful phrase or date. They're comfortable and they're stylish. You don't need to worry about a diamond or a metal band getting damaged or lost. And that's actually what led me to wearing these. I had a platinum wedding band and if I ever touched a barbell with the knurling, it just ripped into it. So I switched and I never looked back. You can get 20% off of your purchase today at Kalo.com slash cleared hot. That's Q Quebec Alpha Lima Oscar dot com slash cleared hot. And your 20% off discount code will automatically be applied at checkout. Kalo.com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by BetterHelp, and that is H E L P. That's right, people. We're going to talk about mental health, my favorite topic. If there is something, anything that is interfering with your happiness or it's preventing you from achieving the goals that you have set for yourself, BetterHelp is here to do just that. Help. They will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with this person in under 48 hours, but it's important to note this is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is a service that provides professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available depending on where you live, and the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account at any time and send a message to your counselor. You can expect a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to sit in a waiting room. Or it just may be more convenient for you to do that. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need to. And it's often more affordable than traditional offline counseling. And they have financial aid available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. That's BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for the podcast listeners, 10% off of your first month at BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. Last but certainly not least, this episode is brought to you by Element, which has been a game changer in my life. Contrary to popular belief, dehydration is not the biggest problem facing most athletes. Overhydration, sans, which is Dutch for without, electrolytes, is... 
Why is that? Well, organizations like the Ameri- American College of Sports Medicine recommend drinking beyond thirst to replace lost fluids. And that's why you're going to see so many watering stations on things like marathon courses. Element Recharge is a better solution. It's a tasty electrolyte drink mix designed to support active hydration and a healthy lifestyle. Created by health leaders like my good friend Rob Wolf and Tyler Cartwright, Element has enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium to get you feeling and performing your best. Plus, it has zero sugar, artificial ingredients, or other junk that you're not going to want. Element is the exclusive hydration partner of Team USA Weightlifting and used by dozens of teams across the NFL, NBA, and NHL, and recommended by hundreds of the world's leading health and fitness experts. Electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium are essential for energy and muscle function. And unlike other electrolyte products, Element has generous portions of them. You're guaranteed to find a flavor you're going to like. Citrus salt, orange salt, raspberry salt, chocolate salt, mango chili, lemon habanero, raw unflavored, and the brand new watermelon salt. If you're an athlete, if you sweat... If you care about performance, stop messing around. Go to drinklmnt.com slash cleared hot and use the promo code cleared hot. Get started now. I recommend getting the variety pack. It's amazing and no joke has made a huge difference in my life. That's all on the business side of the house. Let's talk about my guest today, an amazing woman in many respects. Her name is Holly McKay. You may have heard her recently on the Jocko podcast or slightly before that on the Mike Drop, which is Mike Ritland's podcast. Both were fantastic episodes, and I recommend that you go listen to both. In a nutshell, Holly is an author or a journalist, uh, born and raised in Australia, made the trek to the United States. She got her feet wet in the journalism occupation and then made a choice, a choice to go places and talk to people that I feel most would avoid at all costs for the majority of their life, if not their entire life. She spent time and actively sought out active war zones. She's covered wars in Iraq, Syria, conflicts in Israel, Afghanistan, kind of all over the Middle East, and at a time where it was the height of the ISIS onslaught. She is the author of a book called Only Cry for the Living. And I, there's no way that I can do an accurate job describing what that book is about or the horrendous nature of some of the experiences that she covers in that book. So instead of me trying to describe it, I will let her describe it herself. Episode number 182 with Holly McKay. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Staring at the stars. I look like I'm yeah. on ayahuasca or something. I don't have any experience with that, so I'm going to take your word for it. However, right. I have so many friends who have gone down the ayahuasca, ibogaine, Five MEO DMT is my thing, yeah. I haven't done the ibogaine, done the ayahuasca. Did you... Do the five MEO DMT because you were searching for something to help you deal with what you have gone through in the past? I think it was it was that and then just sort of a combination of definitely that and then just kind of I, I just think it, there's something everyone can kind of get from it and the experience that there's something in there that that about yourself that you can learn. That is what people who yeah. I know who have used that have described. Most of them yeah. actually. I can walk that back. Everybody I know who has, tr- well, other than Joe, but he's an explorer of a different realm, right? In both space, time, and substance, um, right? And I'm that's I'm repeating right. what he says, so I'm not talking negatively about Joe. Yeah. All the people I know are all ex service members, and the mm-hmm. five I did it with an like a, a frogman from the seventies. That is, uh, that's part of what they do. They mm. pair it with. They do. They go down to Mexico and do the whole retreat. Yeah, I know. Friends of mine have had amazing experiences in that. I have no experience with psychedelics. I have vast curiosity about it. Mm. And if I'm being honest, it terrifies me. Yeah, that's why you should do it. I've (laughs) been pitched that reasoning. And my response to that is maybe if the time and the set and setting are correct. Well, the, the FDA is doing a lot of trials on the psilocybin, and mm-hmm. so I'm, you know, I'm thinking of investing in some of the companies, just you know, small, small stocks, because I think it's going to be the big thing for mental health in the next decade, you know, less than that even. I think it'll be bigger than any pharmaceutical absolutely option. Yeah, 
And so I I see that as kind of the frontier now of mental health moving forward now that everybody's kind of aware of the, what these SSRIs are doing yeah. and all this other pharmaceutical crap. So, But did you have that experience with the uh, 5-MeO-DMT post writing the book or the experiences that you This was all after. Okay. Um, I struggled with, you know, that they how yeah, they talk about this whole letting go of the ego thing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, this is fine, you know, I got this. And <laughs> when you're in it, all these distractions, which you later kind of identify as being part of your ego, come up. And I, I had to do it a second time because I didn't think the first time, I found it kind of traumatic, but I didn't think I got that much out of it the first time because I guess the second time I knew what to expect. Okay. The first time I think I was still really like kind of fighting it a little bit and trying to be like, I can, I've got this, I can, I can take a whole bunch of this and it's not going to do anything to me. And so I think once I gotten over that and you're able to process it and under, and know what you're getting into I think it's a bit of a different experience but each person's different so yeah it took me a few times to be able to kind of go okay this is what I get now yeah one of these days maybe yeah this is as close as I can go to it yeah so I listened to your podcast with Jocko and I'm going to start this one by saying this one will be a tough one for me, this mm-hmm. episode, as I think it was tough for Jocko. And I understand why, because at the end of this, I am going to want to kill people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's basically where Jocko <laughs> was at. Right. <laughs> because the things that you guys talked about are they're at a level A that I have struggled to describe to people unless you've physically been there to see them. And and I actively try to not walk away from the person that I used to be because I'm still the person that I used to be, but I try very hard not to be defined by the experiences that I had or a job title that I had or the places that I went. However, uh, the way I describe war is if you touch it, it touches you back. So it leaves an indelible mark on you and you probably do on other people as well. But it was hard to listen to you guys talk about the level of evil that you voluntarily went and got very, very mm. close to. Mm. So we'll see how, see how this goes. All Try right. to stay out of prison for the All rest right. of the day after All we right. end this. <laughs> I got a question for you, though. Yep. What do you, how do you describe evil? I think it's a very nuanced, evil's very nuanced, but if I had to simplify it, it's definitely with the intention of hurting innocent people that have done you no wrong, and yet you somehow find a justification, and they're always a justification in their minds for for doing harm on someone that's never done harm on you. I kind of land near there as well. I, I want people to always believe whatever they want to believe, and you'll, I've had people ask me, well, what's the difference between you and the people that you were fighting? You were t- over there, not me, but like the royal, you know, we, the US military is over there taking life too. And I fall back to, a, there is a huge difference in not only the ideology of what it is that we're fighting for, but at least in my belief system, I can't stand those that prey upon the innocent. And my definition of evil falls back on that as well, too. Those that will either prey upon or stand on the shoulders of those that are incapable of defending themselves. Absolutely. It's very hard to sit back and do nothing about it once you've actually seen it. Right. So. Absolutely. Indeed. Side note that has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about. My sister was born in Australia. Oh, yeah. Whereabouts? I'm going to say this wrong, obviously. But I'll correct you. I want to say Melbourne, but I know that's not right. It's Melbourne. Melbourne. Like See, a bin. Like I a got bin. close. Mel-bin. Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Very young. My dad was a PE teacher, and he was doing an exchange mm-hmm. program and went over, and they were living on a dairy farm and came back plus one. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. I think she still has dual citizenship. Okay. It was before, I believe now they make you pick that you can't have both. I'm both. Okay. Yeah. Shows you what I know. Yeah. I got got my American citizenship in 2017. So. What made you decide to do that versus staying an Australian citizen? Well, I could do both. So it was a gain to me as opposed to anything that was a loss. I mean, I came over here originally in 2006. I was studying got a working visa, then got my green card, and then you sort of hit that five-year mark. And I was so excited to get my American citizenship. I couldn't wait. Yeah. So, yeah, to me it was um, 
it was all a positive. And I think when you're working overseas too a lot, it's just nice to be able to have both. It just makes going to a US base easier. It kind of, you know, if you ever needed help, um, you sort of have these two governments that can go to bat for you. So to me, it was Generally a plus. Generally co-located as well at yes. those bases. Yes. Ish. So yeah, it was a, it was a plus for me. Um, Did you ever find that a US passport closed doors for you? Totally. So... I, and I experienced this a lot, especially going to the Middle East in the beginning when I'd be with American friends and they would have their American passports. And then I'd pull out my Australian and it, my treatment was a hundred <laughs> times different. Um, you know, and even I think a lot, my fixes liked the fact that I was Australian too when I was working over there because then they could sort of be like, oh, she's Australian, she's Australian. It's different, even though, you know, Australia is still there fighting the same fight in a smaller capacity, but they've been there since the beginning. So, but I think people just sort of see it as America and then and then everybody else is is separate. Yeah, it seems very polarizing. And mm. uh, the response I have received is vastly different depending on where you are in the globe. So yeah. for a journalist, it probably is very beneficial. Like Yeah, and today, also with aid, aid workers too. So when I would go and embed, say, with the International Committee of the Red Cross or any of these big aid groups, they loved the fact I had an Australian passport. And I probably wouldn't have been able to go into places with them if I just had my American um, because then it puts the, uh, you know all of them at risk as well. And I think you know, last time I was in Africa and did some stuff with them and – any, I think anyone that was French and American, they were kind of like, ah, no. But um, Australian having that has been has been beneficial, except the only place that they really tell me, yes, use your American passport is in Kurdistan, in uh, okay. the north of Iraq. They're v extremely pro-America. And um, yeah, so anytime that I was around there and you flash an American passport, it's uh, it's a opening doors as opposed to closing them. But, but Do you travel with both? I do. Have it's, you ever had to explain? Oh God, it screwed me. <laughs> I've been, I've had my global <laughs> entry canceled. I've had everything, and I was like, "Why? What is happening?" And you know, I asked an FBI friend of mine when I came back. I was like, "They canceled my global entry. I don't know what happened." He's like, "You're probably just using <laughs> two passports." I was like, "Yeah, I was." <laughs> so I kind of screwed the system um, a little bit. Yeah, and most people are not used to having uh, multiple passports. Jocko actually messed it up when it was on the podcast with you. Oh, he did? He did, because he described the U.S. passport as maroon. He had them backwards. The ones oh, they gave I, us in the military yes. were maroon. And uh, the, the civilians are just good old blue, right. yeah. But it wasn't a diplomatic passport. I think it was just a U.S. I don't think there's a military-specific one. I think it was just a U.S. government one. Right. He makes so few mistakes that I just realized I needed to pounce on that immediately. <laughs> it's like, I didn't like, Jocko said this. They're wrong. How did you link up with Jocko? So actually through uh, Sequoia, uh, at D'Angelo Publications, um, and she does a lot of work with Jocko, and he's a Warrior Kid series, and yep. um, yeah, she said it would be a great fit with the book that I was writing, with the military aspect of it, but, but being from a civilian and being from a sort of a human perspective, and obviously Jocko was very versed in Iraq and the Middle East, and so it was just sort of a, a good fit to, uh, to publish with uh, D'Angelo and with uh, Jocko Publishing. It was a fantastic episode. It was episode 271 for people who want to go listen to it, and I highly recommend that you do. Like I said, it was eye-opening. It uh, I had to I had to listen to it in chunks. I was driving my oldest son to work today, and he was, as most teenage boys are doing, not paying attention to anything that his parents <laughs> were doing. And then he pulled off his uh, his headphones he was listening to his music on. He's like, "What are you listening to? And what are they talking about? Like, just put your headphones back on and." We'll have this conversation a little bit later in life. Yeah. So, it, again, fascinating where you started and what you were doing and then where it led you. I think one of my favorite parts of the podcast with Jock was when you were talking about the Pop-Tarts. Oh, yeah. Which I find might be a more dangerous industry than being on the front lines of war as far yeah. as survival. Totally. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Um, you might have to describe to people what it is. Yeah. Brief background of yeah. Pop-Tarts. Yeah. So I was fortunate enough. I was studying in New York. Obviously, I'm Australian. I was studying in New York. I got this random internship at Fox News in New York, and I didn't have any idea what it was. This was in 2006. So it was sort of the beginning of that digital era. And I love to write. And I think I was 20 at the time. And so they said, look, we'll sponsor you. Do you want to go to LA? You can have your own column. And uh, basically, we'll throw you to the wolves and it's all on you. And I just thought, what an amazing opportunity at that age to get. And so I, I jumped on it and went out to LA. And it was literally 
baptism by fire. I remember my first day there, you know, learning to drive on the other side of the road and you know, getting an apartment <laughs> in Santa Monica and <laughs> arriving in this just totally new world. Um, I remember, you know, I, we talked about, you know, it was Paris Hilton had just come out of jail and yeah. somehow, you know, I had some Aussie friends of mine that were friends with her. And so we ended up spending the summer at her house. It was all these just bizarre things were happening. Um, and I think it just, I never really took it very seriously. I just thought, oh, this is a bloody circus, you know, and I just, I think that's what enabled me to be able to really do my job and get really entrenched in understanding how to piece a story together was that I wasn't their friend. I was just sort of part of this sphere of trying to understand the dynamics of something. But very early on, I was also kind of involved in a lot of investigative stuff. So I, I was lucky in that I got to sort of straddle a general assignment world with the entertainment industry. Did you see people who were also under the banner of journalism going the other direction, where it became less about reporting anything and more about becoming part of the scene? I would say 95%. You know, it was 95% um, you know, kissing people's ass. And uh, yeah, and that I, I knew very early on that I had zero interest in that. And um, I turned down quite a, a few opportunities at some of those big entertainment networks at the time because I just saw what they, you know, what are you wearing kind of stuff and that just, it had about zero appeal. For me, that was just a launching pad to get into journalism, to get my American sponsorship and to be able to kind of take it and run from there. But it was a great training ground because you do smell that bullshit very early on. You learn to navigate these big networks of people where there are just so many uh, layers of managers and agents and all this kind of nonsense. And so you sort of have to learn how to infiltrate that space a little bit. And so it really, it really taught me a lot and interview techniques. So if they're throwing Johnny Depp in front of you, you're going to get three questions if you're lucky. So you really have to know what you're asking and you have to be succinct and you have to get it out and get the answer you need to craft a story. And so you can't sort of diddy daddle around and ask 10 questions and talk about hair and shoes or whatever. You really have to get to the point of it. And so I think very young, I, I had to really learn how to, to be very direct. Not to use Johnny Depp as an example, we'll just say anybody who's in that sphere. Is it that they don't want to answer more than three questions or the people that are around them that are handling them don't want to give any one person that time? I think it's a, a combination of both, um, depending on who the person is. I think that generally speaking, it's it's a rushed process and, and you go into a press junket for a film and they will time you at five minutes and they'll say, last question. You'll have people waving their hands if you continue to go over, which I always did because I always had more I had to ask. <laughs> but, um, but I think you know, a lot of the time, depending on the person, they'd probably love to sit there and chat with you. And there are definitely situations where you can do kind of a full sit down for a lot longer. But generally speaking, it's it's very quick and it's it's very sort of in and out, in and out, and they have a lot of people to process. Um, so yeah, it's usually they're basically told what they you know what their time frame is too. I've only touched that world, and by that I mean been around it very very peripherally. Mm. <clears throat> I had my head in I guess the literal and metaphorical sand for over a decade. Popped out of it. With the military background, there are people in that industry. It's like, hey, come and do some technical advising. So very, very limited roles. But it was it was pretty startling to see that world. And I don't think I knew anybody who would have any level of fame before that. And I found that there were two pretty distinct tranches. There were people who were completely and utterly out of their mind and consumed by who they were or who they thought they were. And then there were some actually really genuine people kind of at the same mm. level of fame. And I didn't find that many that were in between. It was as if you were able to maintain yourself or you lost yourself in that world. I, it, it, I wanted no part of it. I couldn't back step away from that fast enough. Yeah. I actually found that a lot of the really A-list people were, were quite grounded and were very level-headed and very polite and very respectful. And it was this sort of C, D, up and coming people that really, you know, thought the world of themselves and, and were usually the ones that were a little bit, you know, worse for wear. So, I mean, let's be honest, they would cut their co star's throat to stand on their shoulders to get the B level job to get the A level job. I totally, yeah, <laughs> totally. That's no. what I saw. And I was like, okay, you guys are cutthroat. I want none of this. Yeah. Um, and you can have all the fame and all the money and all this bullshit. I would yeah. rather be completely poor and uh, have a life rich with experience than all the shit you guys are doing out here. Yeah, and I just, yeah, no, and I would look at that too and I it was baffling to me because 
they just make so much money pretending to be other people and you know you meet the real people the real people that are doing stuff and you're just kind of like who actually has it better because you might <laughs> you're making money pretending to be someone but yeah. you know someone else may not have much money but they're actually living a very full life and and i think i gravitated more to the music world um especially when i was younger and i i thought possibly about going into music journalism because I'd grown up as a dancer and grown up just loving music and and it was just such a big part it still is a big part of my life uh, in many ways and I found musicians were often very creative and it's not really an industry you can fake as much so I I really enjoyed being able to kind of do the music pieces that was something and I would go on little you know tours with different artists and and stuff and and really get to know them from the early days you know I remember Taylor Swift, she would have been about 15 and she invited me and a couple of other people to a little guitar thing and she was just a new girl, you know, her publicist Paula would stand there with a little card saying, this is Taylor and she's a new artist and da da and we went and she would just play a few songs on the guitar for us and then she'd send these beautiful handwritten notes just thanking us for coming and so it was just lovely to see people like her who you sort of saw before that they were anything just you know become sort of the superstars they are today and just really deserving of it I think just a really good human being yeah I don't actually know I know a few people in the entertainment industry like I was saying in the the acting genre I don't think I know any performance artists I do think it would be harder to fake I mean you can either sing or you can't yeah I don't know exactly what auto-tune does I've heard people talk about how good it is but I'm not (laughs) I don't think I'll ever be a singer. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, I don't think I will be either. I think it'd be pretty <laughs> dangerous. Do you still do ballet? Not, not in a formal sense. Uh, I still, it's still a big part of my life, and that I love it. I follow it. You know, I'm reading a, a beautiful uh, Susanna Farrell memoir now, and she was sort of George Balanchine's prima ballerina, and so I still love it. It's still a big part of of life, and just basic kind of training to keep my flexibility and to keep my feet working. I was, I just taught a class for the first time in a really long time on the weekend in Virginia. So that was, that was kind of a lot of fun. So it's still something I love and it's still a very grounding thing for me, but it's not something I do in any sort of formal capacity. You and Jaco touched on it briefly, but not nearly in depth enough. And that is how savage ballet is. Oh, it's good. Like the coming up and in, in achieving a level of stardom in Ballet, yeah. Because you were you, you were talking about you were still in Australia. You were in a boarding school, which yeah. was it was dedicated to the arts, right? Specifically mm-hmm. ballet. Let's unpack what a day would look like at this particular boarding school. Right. Oh, it, I still say it was the best years of my life, even <laughs> though it was crazy and it was just you know you put a bunch of of you. Know, it was a co-ed school, but mind you, the the guys were very outnumbered by the by the girls, and we had a boarding house, which was relatively small, but it was twenty about, about twenty girls. But uh, yeah, it was amazing. So. We it was had a Scottish heritage, so they would make us wear these ridiculous uniforms with kilts and berets and and all of that. And we'd go usually do some academic stuff. We start pretty early, and then most of the day was spent in in whatever stream that you chose. So there was people that were in musical theatre, people that were drama, people that were dance, ballet, um, and then and then music, of course. And then I was a ballet girl. So yeah, most of the day was spent just training pretty hardcore how many hours are we talking um and then we did after school too so we're probably looking at god and then saturdays so you're looking at could be up at least 20 to 30 hours a week on top of school and academics and you know still having to pass the same tests and exams as as ordinary high schoolers were what type of toll does that take on your body Huge. And I I think I have had every possible injury under the sun and I would have permanent physio sessions. Every other day I'd be at that. We had a a physiotherapist in in the studio that was just there full time. So every time I've heard people who come from the ballet world, they describe that hours toes that are, you know, the ballet slippers, they look fantastic. They're like, yeah, take those things off. And It's not that it's horrendous in a bad way, but it's the physical manifestation of what it requires. Has it always been like that in ballet? Like if to get to the top, does it require that level of incredible discipline and torture on your body? Or is that something that has just attached itself? So military training has changed over time. Mm. They've realized that you don't actually 
always have to grind people into dust to reshape them into the tool that you need. Like as things evolve, maybe our training can evolve too. I almost feel like ballet has this history of this is what it is. This is what it takes. This is what how hard it's always going to be. You know what I mean? I'm trying mm, to figure totally. out. Totally. Yeah. So I think in the beginning with ballet, you know, uh, it was very the French sense and, and King Louis, and he loved to have this idea of ballet dancers. And I think it was a little frivolous back then. They certainly didn't have to have the, there wasn't the weight restrictions. There wasn't the, um, you know, kind of technique that was required. It was more just a, a lighter entertainment. And I think really throughout the 20th century, it evolved. And probably the most famous instructor was a, a Russian man named George Balanchine who defected from Russia. I think it was in the 50s now or 60s and he founded New York City Ballet and he really revolutionized this idea. He was the one that kind of had this idea that ballet dancers had to be real thin, um, they had to have you know incredible feet, incredible flexibility and it really just entirely shifted I think the world dynamic of what ballet was. I think since the Balanchine era it's it's gone back to a little bit more um, flexibility, so to speak, in diversity sense, in that is a lot more contemporary, the sort of the strenuous technique has maybe eased a little bit, but I, I would say that the, this discipline is still there because it is so competitive and yet you can really only make it if you're this sort of ethereal creature. What does it look like to make it in ballet? Like, What is the absolute shooting star? So, oh God, that, it depends. I would say that, I mean, definitely don't go into it for money. So that sort of puts, you're doing it really for the passion and the love of the craft. And it's often a very short-lived career, injury-wise. Yeah. Um, so, you know, being a principal dancer, I guess, in, in a major company is the pinnacle. I would say that the Russians still do it pretty much the best. Um, their schools, the Bolshoi and the Marinsky Theater are just, the Russian dancers are insane. Their level of technique, their level of flexibility, their level of uh, just, it's a whole other level, I think, even to the United States. But to make it to the top is, is really getting into one of the, the top-notch companies and, and moving up the echelons of that to sort of become a soloist or a principal. I'm going to take a hard pass on that. <laughs> right. Mostly because of the outfits, if I'm being totally honest. Right. Those pants the guys wear are incredibly tight. Like, yeah. It's not, it's not acceptable. Not acceptable? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> not here in Montana. You wear those pants out here. Oh, uh, yeah, no, People, that probably you say, like, work. Hey, man, what's going on? We don't do that up here. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you. I bet you. So when you were – how'd you find your way into ballet, actually? You know, I think it was just – I was young. We grew up in the country. There wasn't really that much to do. And my mother stuck my sister and I in classes. Um, so, and then call that paid childcare. Yeah. And then she really, she really forced us to stick it out though, because for me, I yeah, got a bit bored and wanted to, you know, go run around and climb trees with everyone else. But mom would make me, make me stay. And I think you sort of, once you push through the, I'm bored, this is boring. I don't want to do this. Um, and you find the love for it. I think for me, it was also a place to go. So I think I had a fairly undisciplined upbringing in the sense that growing up in the country uh, where I was able to pretty much do what I wanted, you know, that kind of running around till the sun came down type thing. I think ballet was really something that gave me a, a sense of discipline that I didn't otherwise have. And so I, I kind of enjoyed it. It gave me structure. It gave me a place to be. Um, and then as I got older and something I started to take more seriously and once I'd pushed past the boredom of it all, um, it really, there was something just freeing about that kind of discipline and structure. You that found I really, a love for it? Yeah, I did. I really found a love and I, I found a love for the music and I found a love for choreography and I found a love for just being able to explore these different things and, and being able to choose these incredible costumes and, you know, we'd, I'd go away a lot on weekends to different competitions and it just, yeah, you, you sort of develop this healthy sense of competition, but it was always about just trying to be better and, and, and improve on what you could do. And I think that from a young age was really beneficial for, for me. When you were at the boarding school, which obviously was arts based, did you have any aspirations to head towards journalism or did that come later mm. on? Where did you make the jump between yeah, the two? I always loved to write. And actually, I published a book when I was very young. Um, I think I was about 12 or 13 that I'd written. Really? Yeah. So a lot of my childhood was spent. My grandfather had a sugarcane farm 
the very top of Australia in North Queensland. So we'd have to go away for these really long stretches and it was in the middle of nowhere. There was no, you know, it was just nothing. There was no other kids. There was just these big sort of open land and I couldn't go anywhere. So I really just love to write and I love to read. And so I would spend my entire summer writing a book and, and again, using that sort of creativity that dancing had given me. Um, and so, yeah, that, I published that when I was about 12 or 13 and I look back and, and regret it a bit now because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> that, well, not just the book, but I was just so embarrassed about the book even being published and, you know, the newspaper, the local newspaper would come to take a picture and I would just be, oh, I don't want my picture in the newspaper. So I wish that I'd embraced that a little bit more, but, you know, that's being 12 or 13 years old. Um, so I always love to write. So that was always something that I had in my back pocket, but I just didn't, I guess, understand what what that career necessarily could be. Um, and then the journalism, yeah, it definitely wasn't something I, I didn't have any desire to sit in front of a, a television screen and read a teleprompter. I knew that that wasn't for me and I, I don't think sort of any type of camera job would have been for me. It just wasn't something I was interested in. And that actually worked to my advantage because when I ended up becoming an intern, and basically everybody wanted to be on camera, so they were sort of you know, shuffled off to um, do probably quite generic internship stuff. And I was really the only one who sort of stuck my hand up and said, oh, I just want to write. So I ended up being the only one in the in the digital area and then the only one who got sponsored. So, What year was this? That was 2006. New and this is in New York at the- In New York, yep. I, I've actually been to that building, yep. the Fox News uh, studio there and kind of seen behind the scenes. Not a job I would want either. Yeah. It's a talent for sure to be able to sit and look semi-normal and read the teleprompter. If people actually think, though, that they're saying maybe what they personally believe or yeah. they're making it up on the fly, they're a little bit misguided as yeah. to what's happening at those places. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool building for sure, though, and an interesting place in New York. Not Queensland, for sure. Definitely it's not. Different uh, geography and topography, I would say. Slightly different. Although I loved my life in New York. I really, really? did. Yeah. I hate that city. I only with just passion. gave up my apartment last year. <laughs> oh, I, I can't stand, I, I don't like being that compressed. I'm not going to New York is beautiful. I've yeah. been there a handful of times. I actually love going to New York. I What I realized by moving here to being in a more rural area is that I really enjoy a little bit of space, which sure. I think we can agree New York is city specifically is not defined by. Yeah. And I'm with you and I'm at a point in my life where I definitely love the space and I love the quiet and I love that less hustle and bustle life. And I don't know that I will go back to it ever or, you know, if I do, it would have to be for a really alluring offer. But I think that my time that I sort of spent there, both, you know, turning 21 in New York plus, um, the last between 2017 and then up until the end of last year that I was there were just really incredible times to kind of be able to to go to the city and to be in that sort of vibe and and the connections that you make and the friends that you make and I just think that I was I'm glad that I had that experience because there is you know New York is sort of a dirty very compressed place but there's just something about it that is just is is freeing in a way I think because you can just really be anyone you want to be yeah no it's almost like a lot of the things you write about in the book hard to describe but if you've been there and felt it you're like oh I understand yeah so you start with the pop tart working for New York yes and then you decide I am going to go and essentially seek out the front lines of war mm -hmm. uh, those are very different genres we mm -hmm. shall say what what sparked that? I mean, even the initial thought process. I mean, I, you talked a little bit about, you know, hey, you realize the BS of the entertainment industry. We can leave it at that. But that doesn't necessarily drive people to saying, maybe I want to go to the front lines of war. I mean, there's mm. a lot of other options to choose from. What was it that drove you in that direction? I think it was really just curiosity. So I've always been a very curious person. I've always wanted to really understand things at a deeper level. And I just felt you know, so many friends of mine had gone to Iraq and Afghanistan to serve and, and I just felt that we weren't getting a full picture of what was really happening there and it bothered me and I felt that it was just things were simplified in a way that they shouldn't have been 
And I had done a lot of investigative journalism, not necessarily in the foreign space, but just sort of locally uh, with politics and a few big stories. Um, so I kind of knew how to piece things together in a way. And I really just sort of pushed for that opportunity and, and told my bosses that this was something I wanted to do. And they were extremely supportive of that. And um, I think because I was very self-sufficient, I didn't require big crews. I didn't you know, need to go in there with big teams of people. I didn't go in there with security. I was very under the radar, which I felt to be you know, better security policy for me than, than trying to sort of go in with a bunch of people. So Pros and cons to it, for sure. Absolutely. And you and Jocko did a very good job of discussing the pros yeah. and cons of that. A smaller footprint can be great mm -hmm. until you're in a position where a bigger footprint would be really yeah. nice to have and some yeah. security personnel. Yeah. How do they teach investigative journalism? I mean, writing is one thing. The investigative portion of that is fascinating to mm. me. It, is it something you fall into that you have, again, like ballet, maybe you get through that initial process and find your own love for it? Because I feel like it would be much more of an art form than maybe a skill that is taught. Yeah. yeah. I, no one ever taught me. What I relied upon was other journalists that could sort of mentor me into understanding how to put it together. So essentially an editor might call me and say, hey, this we heard this is happening, can you look into this? And you really, I think a lot of it's very instinctual. You have to kind of pare it down. You have to look at, well, how can I break this down? Who can I talk to? What doors can I knock on? What court records can I, I bring up? What, you know, you go through every sort of background you possibly can on a computer in, in way back machine in trying to piece together um, as many sources as you know that might be surround a person and and it's really just it's it's like a little jigsaw that you just start to piece together and somebody might give you a lead here and someone else might give you a lead there and then you might get completely stuck and go oh my god what do I do now um, and then you have to let it go for a week and then you come back to it so it's really a lot of it really does come down to as well and depending on the topic is your sources so mm -hmm. you have to be able to you know if it's a local crime you have to be able to have really good resources within the local police department or you go to the family, or, you know, it just, it really depends on the story, but it is, it's instinctual and it's patience. But looking back on it, I, I definitely think instincts play a really big role and you have to know how to smell that bullshit and who's telling you the truth and who's not. So that is, um, and it was always a challenge and I, I can't tell you how many stories I would devote weeks and, and months to that never went anywhere because I could just never put it all together quite right. Is there supposed to be, or is there, a governing principle when it comes to journalism. And I guess when I ask that, I'm looking at it from the lens of, you know, as a, as a journalist, you could perhaps get information through sources that are not necessarily legal. Mm. Um, you know, you could go outside of the boundaries of the law to try to report or gather information. I don't want to say, you know, in the military, right, we have the UCMJ, right? You right. violate the UCMJ, right. you get punished. So it's it's a buffer that you know when you're getting to the edge of it, and you definitely know if you uh, you recognize it when you see somebody cross it. But in the journalism world, is there, are there principles that are hard and fast like that? Can you break the law uh, in the pursuit of information? I don't think you can break the law specifically. I just think there are ethical obligations or murky ethics. I was going to say, are they yeah. written anywhere? Do we have a Ten Commandments of Ethics in journalism? No, I know. <laughs> but, you know, journalism schools and things will teach people this is what you can and can't do. And, and I always try to, to stay by those ethics. And I definitely wouldn't do anything that was in you know breaking a law, so to speak. But, um, but you know. It's you pure curiosity. Can, yeah. I, I know very little about journalism. Um, and I come from a world where Black and white is a terrible uh, yeah. metaphor for the, the world that I operate in, but I had a framework to mm. operate from. And I knew as I got farther from the framework, it would get more gray or even a different color palette. Yeah. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, and then you can look at, you know, situations where maybe government entities are the ones that are breaking the law in leaking the information. So then what role do you play as the journalist if you're going to publish that? So there and there are ethical obligations and, and things like that would often come up and that would in require discussions with my editors, with legal department at, at work. And there's sort of a, a team of people that, that generally have to come in and kind of make a consensus over 
what the best course of action would be. Well, I could see it getting to a place where perhaps the reporter has a different ethical or moral stance on the information than, say, the publishing organization. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine those conversations could get pretty tense at times. Absolutely. And I remember the San Bernardino terrorist attack and and there was a big ethical issue with that because the police had left the the door open for the where the terrorists were living. And so it was this dilemma of do you go into the house and take photographs of the where the terrorists were living and you know find clues of you know into what their mindset was or is that sort of illegal entry? You know, the door's open, but um, you know, what what is the the blurry ethical line here and it, it was quite a hoopla for a long time and you had two very distinct camps on that. When you got your first, uh, you know, obviously you described that you went to the people you were working for and saying, hey, you know, I want to make a shift. This is where I want to go. Or it probably it was more along the lines of this is what I want to do. Where was your first trip to a war zone? So the first time I was covering really, uh, I'd been into Syria before, but it wasn't in a sort of a coverage capacity. But I guess the Gaza-Israel conflict in 2014 I was in Jordan at the time, and so I was able to kind of go back, and and that was the first time I was really able to cover something um, in that sense, and and really get this baptism by fire understanding of of that conflict. And timely, yeah. given what's currently yeah, going on, it's I absolutely. don't know if that one that's going to I think be a also a pendulum that goes back and forth. They're going to have I think times of peace and then times of what's going on right yeah, now. Yeah, and it's going to be nothing new to what we've seen in the past 30, 40 years, and it's, a, it's really unfortunate. And I think I can definitely see that from both sides, having been able to cover and, and speak to people on, on both sides of that conflict and um, and definitely see where, where both points of view have their pros and, and cons of that. And it's just going to require compromise that isn't, isn't quite there yet. When was the first time that you embedded with U.S. military? So I didn't, I started then after that, I was going into Iraq to cover ISIS, but I didn't do an embed. I'm trying to remember the first, because the U.S. weren't in Iraq until much later. Oh, three, it was the initial invasion. Oh, I mean for the ISIS conflict. Got you. So I think I did an embed with them, must have been 2015 when they first sort of started coming in. To go back a step, you know, I was thinking about this before we sat down. I... I think I was out of the military before I heard the term ISIS. Right. For me, it was Taliban mm-hmm. in Afghanistan tied to creating a safe haven for Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda, right. however you want to say it. In Iraq, it was, I don't remember ever hearing the term ISIS. I think it was a term that came about, I got out the last day of June 2013. I think it was after my time. Right. When was the first time you remember hearing that term? Or when was the I campaign? remember it specifically. I remember being at work on June of 2014. Okay. And that's when ISIS came in and took Mosul. And that was the first time I'd heard of them, was this sudden group that, you know, had sort of, quote unquote, come out of nowhere and had taken over the second largest city. And that was that was my first hearing of what they what they were, even though, They'd been around for for a bit at that point. But. How would you describe them as a group? When somebody says to you, "What is ISIS?" What kind of answer can you give to them? Uh, uh, there's a lot of conspiracies, but I would say it's it's an offshoot of Al Qaeda. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of people try to sort of say, "Well, they're much more brutal than Al Qaeda." I really think they're all the same. Um, yeah, it and, depends on who you ask yeah. and what your touch point was with them. Yeah, so they're just a you know a terrorist organization, Islamic terrorist organization. Um, and they have uh, an idea of wanting to create a caliphate. Which people should Google Mm -hmm. before we continue on on the podcast because we may be talking about the caliphate a touch, and those who want to have one of those. uh, Not my cup of tea, I will say. No, I'd rather pass. I would rather pass as well. So I'm going to go back just so I get the timeline right. When you were first in Gaza and Israel, what year was that? 2014. 2014. Okay, so fast forward 2015, your first embed with Americans. Right. That was Americans in Iraq and then later Afghanistan. Where did well, where were you in Iraq and who were you embedded with? So honestly, I, my embeds are very small. Most of my work is is outside embed, but um, I did some work in the north with where the Americans were based there, and also in Baghdad, and then also with the Australians in Baghdad, and then I was with the Italians for a little while too, and they were in Mosul Dam. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm trying to remember if that was it. And then just, I guess, the Iraqi army and some of the advise and assist programs uh, in, in and around Baghdad. So um, Taj, Taj, I think we were there for a while and then um, up to sort of Ramadi area near the border and... Yeah, that was with the Marines, I believe. And then, yeah. But my my embeds were usually, they weren't necessarily all that long. They were usually just short. I was generally, had a very clear focus. It was usually just kind of wanting to, to interview the general about particular situations and then kind of get a feel for the work that Iraq was doing. And I think that the press department also are very, uh, what's the word? They're very much wanting to highlight what, the Iraqis were doing and it was all about yeah. the Iraqis are in charge of this mission and you can take it that or leave that um, well it, cha- it yeah. shifted how should I say this people think because they were told that we left Iraq what was it, about 2010 ish reality is um, no there have always been American boots well not always but there have been American boots on the ground since the initial invasion in 03 was it drastically reduced? Yes, it was. But in from a policy perspective, it shifted to by, with, and through. Mm-hmm. So it probably was directed or dictated to you that, hey, these are the important talking points because that's what was being told sure. to everybody. Was yeah. there an aspect of by, with, and through? Absolutely. But is that also, if you want to play on the chessboard that is presented to you, is that also an opportunity to buy with, and through a small partner force to do the things that you want to do? Yes. Right. So there's both that were going on. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that that wanted to be that they wanted that to be the focus for you because that was yeah. what was driving policy at that yeah. time period. And that's probably you know a lot why I, I generally spent most of my time either with local sort of forces or different sort of ragtag groups and things on the ground because I just felt that that was an area that I could cover a little bit more freely. And not yeah. that not that in, I was in any way censored, so to speak, but. I just they can censor you yeah. by limiting your access. Yes, it, it, yep. it, you know it's a it's just a it's a step removed. And that was I was going to ask you that question when you were there embedded with U.S. forces or uh, NATO countries, how close would they let you get to what was actually going on? Because um, there's a variety of, yeah. of embeds. Like, hey, you can come and visit our talk, which is tactical operations yeah. center. You can watch from behind these streets. That's very different yeah. than sitting in a vehicle convoy or getting on a helicopter and going and actually involving yourself with the local populace. Yeah. So most of my sort of more combat oriented were local with local groups because, you know, again, the narrative was that the U.S. wasn't fighting on the front line with this with the ISIS conflict in particular. And so I think it would have defeated the purpose of what they were trying to say if I was going anywhere kind of near a front line with the US. Yeah. Um, So most of that I did with either the Iraqi army or with the Kurds or with the Syrians um, and sort of did that on my own terms. Probably this uh, similar in Afghanistan as well. Yeah, similar, very similar in Afghanistan. Again, the the focus was on what the Afghan troops were doing. and, And, you know, to be honest, though, I I did find it a little perplexing in Afghanistan and in Iraq just you know you have these uh, wonderful men and women that are going over to serve and and they've spent 18 months there however long the deployment is and just have never been able to leave the base like step foot outside of it and I to me that was sort of a reflection of perhaps what is going wrong in a place like Afghanistan where and I would talk to talk to the soldiers and things and and I was surprised that they're limited view or understanding of the politics in the streets of Kabul. And I really had to put that down to that's because they're not allowed to go and mingle and understand how the local people are thinking and what they want and what they feel. And so I sort of think the the, the perspective then only becomes who is allowed to come onto that base and who's passed that clearance and all that sort of stuff. And you're not really getting that full sense. And I think that that was missed a lot in Afghanistan. And I thought, unless you're kind of going to do it properly, what's the point of doing this? It doesn't surprise me that most of them had less of an understanding of the local mm-hmm. politics or even a, a tribal culture versus a democracy, which at least U.S. forces are coming from. And, and the reason for that is, is it's not made an emphasis in their mm-hmm. training. Yeah. You know, the soldiers that go over there, the U.S. military is very, very good at some things. One of the things they're not great at is nation building, which we have demonstrated many times throughout the course of history. But another one is and I and I and I understand it to a degree, even Mm -hmm. from my own occupation, we would have a reading list. You know, one of the books that they uh, heavy early on in Afghanistan, Three Cups of Tea. Oh, yeah. Hmm. 
do a little research on that author and the authenticity of that book. We'll leave that for, we'll shelf that for some other time. People can research that on their own. It made the main reading list. And so they'd give you six or seven books. And uh, I remember at Team 3, my last appointment, we were getting ready to go in 2010. And right before, they would bring somebody who had a uh, foreign national from that country who they would talk a little bit about cultural things, you know, maybe from an interaction perspective, things that you might expect. Like, hey, if one of the guys comes up and grabs your hand, don't, you know, don't, A, maybe don't be surprised by it, but you don't have to snatch it out of their hand because you, a lot of cascading things are going to come badly from that. Mm. I was in special operations. That's the level of training that I was getting. Mm. We had, I wouldn't say an unlimited budget, but we had the ability at least a little bit to craft our training schedule inside of the parameters that we needed to do. Take it a budgetary level down, uh, a precise level of training down, and those are the people that you are talking about. I'm not saying that negatively at all. They just had a very different, more broad role and responsibility. And if you don't, if you don't own it and train it, mm it shouldn't be a surprise. But then you drop those people overseas for 18 months and it's possible that they could come back with the exact same lack of understanding of that country that they went there. And mm -hmm. that's, to me, that's not how you, and I don't know if win is the right term, that's not how you inch towards success, in my opinion. Right, and I, I definitely felt that that was, you know, and it's not that they want, I mean, of course they wanted to go out and be able to really do their job to the best of their ability, but I think it, yeah, it just was something, especially after Benghazi, things got really locked down even more after that in, in combat sort of areas. And I think that it was sort of, a, in a way, a disservice, even though I do understand it. And, yeah. and But I think in the overall picture... Well, you it said it, missed. if you're not going to do it right, why do it at What's all? What's the point? Yeah. yeah. There is no point, yeah. is the answer. And then you could put a tinfoil hat and suit on and say it's all about the military industrial complex. And the point is we're just going to enrich some people while standing on the shoulders of the young and lists like, okay, I'm not going to go down that hole anymore. Yeah. Some people could say those things. I don't know. I might have like a tinfoil visor on sometimes, but I'm not going to put the whole hat on because I can see shades of all of that. Mm. But it's, it's a tough one, tough one to describe, tough one to explain. And I can't even imagine being on a deployment in either Afghanistan or Iraq and not being able to leave the base for 18 months. It's yeah. a very bizarre view if you only see it from behind barbed wire and HESCOs. It's not some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in Afghanistan. In my entire life, we're in Afghanistan in, mm -hmm. and in Iraq as well, too, like along the western Euphrates River Valley, the yeah. beautiful area down there. Um, Pandia Valley in Afghanistan. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Hard to describe. Yeah. I've seen pictures of it, and you're like, that's that's nothing. You should see it in person. Yeah. You know, as the sun's you're just like, holy shit. Yeah. And uh, I feel fortunate to some degree that we, well... We got to go out and interface more than a lot of conventional units did, not necessarily interfacing probably in the ways that most people are thinking. But like my last deployment, we were completely doing village stability operations. We were living amongst, doing our best that we could to help, going to the weekly meetings, sitting down with the elders. Whether or not any of that stuff helped do anything, at least it's a different perspective and you're getting out and you're trying to get a, a better understanding of the country. Um, <clears throat> And if I'm being honest, I left Afghanistan in my last rotation more frustrated than I've ever been in my right. life because yeah. you try as hard as you can for 10 months and you realize none of that is going to change anything. And it's not going to change anytime soon now yeah. or whether we leave now or we leave in 10 more years. It's just, it's Afghanistan. The Soviets couldn't win, you know, no other force is able to sort of beat that. And, and I think we missed opportunities in looking at the root causes and was sort of fixated on certain symptoms in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we have the physical ability, I think, as a U.S. military to take almost every chess piece off of the board. Mm -hmm. and, you, and again, you and Jocko talked a little bit about this. Tens of thousands of ISIS soldiers can be killed. It, the ideology, if unless you are able to get the correct individuals, the ideology can still live on, or not even necessarily the individuals. The, unless you can correct, I, I really like how you talked about corruption and how mm. corruption can, how can change people's views when it comes to the decisions that they make. If you don't set the stage properly, then that ideology is gonna continue to live on. If one of those people exists and they have that ideology and the stage is correct, they're gonna be able to pull those people across the line. You know, at some point, 
you know, bombs and bullets are not going to be the solution. Not that I have the solution, anybody listening to this by any stretch, but I am in a place now where I think bombs and bullets are not enough alone. No, I, you definitely need the diplomatic aspect, but you definitely, in my opinion, it's just the the level of corruption that happens in government that for some reason we the U.S. has decided that it's so systemic and there's nothing we can do about it and it's just going to exist regardless. So we throw up our hands and say there's nothing we can really do. So to me, terrorism is so often a symptom of it. And I just think unless you're going to get to the root cause of it, you're never, you're never going to really deal with it. And I don't have the answers necessarily of getting to that root cause of it. Yeah. But I think just throwing money at a government that is going to, you know, service themselves, and that can be whoever's in power and the different echelons of power. And if it's not going to the people or the people don't see a betterment in their lives, then they're going to get pretty frustrated after a while. And I would like people who are listening to you and I talk about this, I would like them to shift their focus on the U.S. because I can see flavors of the decisions people are making and groups that they're getting behind in the U.S. Right. For exactly the same reasons that we're talking about ISIS. Remove that term. And I'm not trying to make a value comparison between any of these organizations. There are people in the U.S., and I think the number of people are, is growing, that believe that our government is corrupt at a, at a, I don't know at what depth of level, but you hear them talking about it. And you see small fringe organizations inside of the U.S. And I'm going to pick one that's recognizable, and I'm not saying this is the only one because I got into a fucking Instagram argument with a guy today about this. QAnon. I made a okay. joke about QAnon. Okay. The guy's were like, fuck you, man. How come you're not making fun of the left? I was like, sorry, dude. You caught me at a moment where I was writing this post and I said that it's hanging on like a QAnon follower in the Reddit threads. It's a joke. Right. And he got pissed because I didn't list the organizations on the left. And, and for full disclosure, I think there's idiots on the right and the left. 100%. They're both equally dangerous. Some people will say that the left is more dangerous than the right. I don't know. I'm not smart enough. My point in all of that is I think the more people feel that there is corruption, the more likely they are to start aligning with those organizations to say things like, we're here to correct the problems. Mm. We're we have the solution for you. Let me identify your enemy. And then they rally behind a cause. And again, they're on the left and the right hand side. But it, to me, as I was listening to you guys talk, I was looking at it through the lens of an American and watching these fringe organizations like, huh, I wonder what those turn into if the perception of corruption or the actual corruption continues. Could it ever get to something at the level of ISIS, which maybe you know the answer to this. How many countries do you think have an ISIS presence? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say it's a to a degree, it depends what... You pledge you allegiance, yeah. yeah. So usually, what how we would identify it would say if you've pledged allegiance to you know, former Abba Baghdadi, or you know, I would say it's a huge presence in a place like Mozambique and parts of Africa. Afghanistan still has its contagion of ISIS. It's still in Iraq and Syria. I would, I would beg to sort of say it's a, at least ten. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I don't know. I don't know about any of the organizations in the U.S. It just, for me, it clicked a little bit. I was like, oh, okay. Mm. That at least makes me, they feel that the power above them is corrupt, that they feel like the current system is not going to correct itself. So they are finding a cause that resonates with them. Is that cause correct? I'm not smart enough to make that uh, determination, but I have a little bit of a better understanding of how they can cross that threshold, which to me Full disclosure is fucking insane. Well, Some it's of these cult thresholds. mentality, I think. And when I think it's really amplified in, in the US by social media. So the way that the algorithms are constructed with Twitter, with you know, Facebook, they they're the ones who sort of rally against this stuff, but they're perpetuating it. So you can take a relatively benign tweet tweet that might be extremist. It takes one or two people with big followings to retweet it. You have all sorts of, and then all you're seeing on your feed is is that echo chamber of people reinforcing this idea. And so suddenly you start to not feel alone. So then you feel a lot more sort of compelled to come out and speak and you feel that you're part of a community. And I think it comes down to a lot of that gang mentality too. So when you're, you're part of a, a system and you're part of a like-minded group and you're all together and you're all pushing for or something that's that's greater than yourself and I think that's being perpetuated essentially by the same people who are cancelling it out um, and, and I think that's why we're seeing it move so quickly compared to 10 years ago where it 
sort of would have stayed either fringe or it would have just sort of taken a long time to become anything. Now it's it's sort of easy to to get caught up into into that fold. It can make the rounds pretty quick. Yes. <laughs> and it's pretty easy to say, hey, let's all get together here. Let's all do this. Let's all do that. And you you don't start to feel that anything you're saying is, is fringe because you have so many people also reinforcing the same thing that you believe. And it's, um, I guess, a shared bonding experience, so to speak. How do you unwind that? It's difficult, I think. Is it even possible to I put that horse back in the stable? I don't even know because the sort of level of disinformation, misinformation, distrust in authority, distrust in media, distrust in whoever, that I think that that people are going to believe what they're going to believe. And I think it is difficult not to say that, you know, there are, of course, certain people will wake up and realize that maybe they were were being screwed, but it is hard to wind, it's hard to wind it down. It's hard to wind it back. And then, of course, then you're running into the the First Amendment issues of what is censorship and what is not and and where does that cross a line and where is it a double standard? You know, you, you delete President, former President Trump off Twitter, but you're still allowing the Ayatollah to remain there and all sorts of other horrible dictators around the world. You know, is that a double standard? I think, to me, yes, but you know, to other people, they might see him as a threat and the others as not. I have cons- I think we're going to be okay. <coughs> but I have concerns if we can't figure out a solution to election security mm. that will restore people's faith in the electoral process. I feel like if we have another election cycle like we did, we're Everything is contested, and then we're contesting the fact that it was context- contested, and people are lost in all the fray. Whew. I mean, I hope there's some very smart people who are trying to figure out a way that can – because if it goes another cycle of that, I think everything that we're seeing is going to take another step forward, or if we're in third gear now, it will go into fourth gear. Yeah. Then I start having concerns. I think we can correct it, but I, that's one of the biggest concerns that I have three years from now, if we cannot figure that out, I think we are headed into some rough waters. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, we've got to start, I know it's difficult and everything online is hackable to a degree, but, you know, we have to start some forward thinking in in what technologies and things we can use for the voting process. And and that will enable much greater swaths of the population to to pa- pass, uh, you know, their civic duty. So I think we need to start instead of thinking of mail in and this and that. You know, what can we do on a technological level? And and I think there's a lot of great innovators out there. And to me, that's something that I'm more interested in than trying to figure out the postman's kind of trajectory. Yeah, I want to figure out how we can restore people's faith in, in a process that has been doing okay. Mm-hmm. We don't have to say great. We don't have to say terrible. But we're here. You and I are here, Holly. Still? Yeah. Okay. If, if you have to show, you know, if you have to show an ID to get a vaccine, and everybody's being encouraged to get a vaccine, you know, shouldn't the same standards kind of apply? And as an Australian, you show an ID. There aren't many places in the world that you cannot. Yeah. You know. So and I saw a list one time of things you have to show an ID for in the U.S. It was a very long list. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you and I. <clears throat> People, of course, will correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the argument that I've heard against it is that, you know, A, not everybody does those things that require those IDs. And it's often difficult for people, specifically in lower uh, rungs of the economic ladder or inner cities, to get those said IDs. Well, let's figure out a solution for that, too. I guarantee you there are dozens, if not hundreds, of NGOs, if you know, foundations in America that will give you your ID for free. That will be, yeah. you know, d- uh, pay for your ID. There yeah. are so many foundations out there to support that kind of thing. I guarantee if that's what is required, there will be a number of people willing to come up and say, hey, I'm going to start a 5013C and I'm going to, fi- you know, you can't afford an ID, come to me. Yeah. I, d- I don't feel it's unreasonable to show an identification card to vote. No. And I and I feel that for what I have heard people arguing against it, that they're solvable problems. So sure. let's solve that and maybe that will start to reinstill that faith yeah. in, in the system itself. I don't know. And then there are people who just don't want to, you know, want to evade the government and don't want to be on an extra thing. And I get that. But how do you buy a house? How do you yeah. get, get a lease? How do you get a car? Like, I mean, what, genuinely, what are you doing to survive if you don't have an ID? How does that work? I'm, 
would love to know, actually. <laughs> I would love to actually sit down with somebody yeah. who's like, yes, I have no paper trail with the government. Yeah. I'll have to figure out how to do like a blurry face on that. I <laughs> never forget this this one story in California of hearing a guy who used to drive in the carpool lane with a bunch of government documents because, you know, quote unquote, he you know was an entity or, you know, a corporation, so to speak, as our, our capitalized versions of our names are. And he could not wait to get pulled over for being uh, in the carpool lane. That poor police officer that... <laughs> I over. think he lost the case. I think, you know, he went to court with it, wanted to argue, well, you know, you, you government makes me a corporation, therefore there's an extra entity in the car here. I think he lost. <laughs> if you have some free time, go on YouTube and look up Sovereign Citizen Police Interactions. Okay. There, It's worth a Google and it's worth a laugh. You'll okay. have a good time. The arguments that they make sound pretty good until you put a little bit of rational, reasonable thought into it, and then it's just, it's pure gold, comedy-wise. Right, wise. right. I'll have to check it out. It's it's worth the time. Back to Afghanistan and Iraq. Wow, we got off tangent, but I like it. Because um, there actually are, as I was listening to you guys talk, there, I, I love the experiences that I had from being overseas. I hate some of them as well. They... It did not make me the person that I am, nor did my job make me the person that I am, but I am the person that I am because I went through those experiences. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. They left a mark on me for sure. I listen to your descriptions of evil and the things that allowed that evil to take place. And <clears throat> I was thinking more about our country than mm -hmm. over there. But Also, I just also a thing I think about a lot when I see – a lot of the protests that start in, you know, whether it's the Women's March or whatever, and they, I just think there's so much, and there are certain many, many things that we all need to address and to fix, and, you know, and I'm all about that. But I also think there's this insatiable need for people that I think in a whole, so many people live very meaningless lives, whether that's their job, whether they're just not fulfilled in what they do, whether they're just going through this kind of motion of a nine to five, trying to pay the bills, trying to get by, as most people in the country are. And there's this need to feel part of something that's bigger than yourself. There's this need to feel like a part of a revolution. And so I, I've i often observed over the years things that I, I guess I, I wrap my head around a little bit because I've seen different level of extremity overseas but this sort of need to be part of history or part of something bigger or feel that you're fulfilling a bigger purpose and you could also say that with the sort of the social justice warrior on Twitter and so that just is something that I think is also driving a lot of the the movements and the extremities we have is just this unfulfilled lives I think that people are just trying to find meaning and a life that is easier than most mm -hmm. there in the u.s right first world country it the first world doesn't apply itself equally to everybody in this country obviously but some of the levels of oppression and poverty and pain and suffering that i have seen overseas some of the people that i interacted with said nothing about it and they found an actual fulfilling life, in their words, not mine, living in that environment. It's a tough one for me to see people. And again, I am aware that we live in a first world country, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that blanket of being in the first world covers everybody. There's different economic levels, socioeconomic. It's a tough one for me to watch somebody complaining on their $1,000 smartphone holding a $6 latte about oppression and suffering when I have that other experience in the back of my mind. It's it's not, I'm not saying that to them it makes it any different, but the, the difference in optic between the pressure of one of those lives versus the other, it is, I, I don't have the, the vocabulary to describe it. Mm. I really am a believer in, and one thing I've observed that's so different, say in the Middle East compared to the US, is this family centric or this community centric environment that people live in overseas where people will you know they're often living together uh, first of all and you know meals are just you roll out that plastic sheet of paper and you sit there and everyone eats and it kind of doesn't matter if there are six people there or 16 you know there's a, however much food and there's this sort of community and I think that that's something we've lost a lot of in the United States is this being part of a broader family or being part of a bigger support network. And I think that's what gets a lot of people by with very little in those places is 
they have strong support systems. Yeah. You'll see that, you know, with the Yazidi girls, when they were trying to raise money to, to bring, you know, pay a ransom to get some of the girls to come back. And it was this entire community effort. It wasn't just on the the father or something to, to have to come up with the money. It was him being able to go to the neighbours and the neighbours went to the neighbours and someone else went here and everybody's sort of pulling in and without question. And we do see that, you know, to a degree here, but there it's just, it's so ingrained and it's something so beautiful that I observed in in the way that they live their lives that I just think we've lost a lot of that. They're more connected in many ways from a physical perspective. Mm. I think people in the U.S. believe they're more connected from a digital perspective and they're right. not, it's not the same. It's not. They'll try to support and, and they're nothing against GoFundMe. Um, I've created them for people before or for the SEAL Foundation. It's not the same. That digital interaction is not the same. I actually haven't thought about it from that lens when you describe how they will, the meals and together and the community, because they certainly, I mean, I've been to some of the most remote villages. I mean, I can't say necessarily anywhere on earth, but at least in Afghanistan and Iraq. And man, they were actually, the people that were living there were very, very tight mm. with no understanding or idea of what was going on in, in the rest of the world for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I, <laughs> Where's Osama bin Laden? They're like, who's that? Yeah, I had the same experience. <laughs> the same experience. Not that that ties into what we're talking about. I know, but, but that, that's was, what... that was typical. They would, they would, they d couldn't understand what was going Where on. Where's Osama bin Laden? They're like, uh, <laughs> you got a picture? Because I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. It. But and again, it's so hard to describe the environment that they live in, and what would just be just complete abject poverty here in the U.S. In how they describe their own life in the context of what they even think is possible. It's a tough one for me. That's one that I that I struggle with given my experience. And I, and I usually will just keep my mouth shut because I want to come off the top rung mm -hmm. on people a little bit when they start complaining. But war is an interesting thing. Yeah. It's definitely taught me to be a lot more of a minimalist human being, I think. It strips away what matters yeah. and what actually doesn't. And what I need and what I don't. And really how comfortable that I can be. Um, you know, being anywhere and this idea of, I guess, for me personally, home not necessarily being a physical place, but more home is sort of home is people, yeah. home are the people that you love and home is where your support system exists. And that can change maybe month to weeks or to a year. But I think that that's what really the work overseas taught me is that it's it's people. It's not a place. Things don't matter. Yeah. People do. I mean, you could, my, I have a home that could burn down now. And if I had, you know, my son who's living with me right now and my girlfriend, I'd be like, you know what? I'm good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't be good for that day. We get a sweet hotel. That's about it. But we're in Kalispell. It's to be like an average hotel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes on. You know, it's, you're not defined by the things that you have. What's the Fight Club quote? Your oh. khakis end up owning you or something? Yeah, oh, it's not, a, your, your stuff ends up owning you. The things you, you own, own end up, end up owning, owning you. you. Yeah. The first world, I have noticed many times, probably maybe this is more in the U.S., it's almost defined by its excess, and that excess, it ends up owning people a lot of the time. I've, I have fallen, and I'm talking about myself when I say this too, I will start having this very bizarre uh, value of objects that actually in the end, at the end of the day mean nothing. And maybe that mm -hmm. object is just money for people or the status or whatever it may be. Strip all that away. If you got the people that you care about the most, I think you're going to be okay. Absolutely. Especially if you have a community. Yeah. And I think to for me too, in LA and in my New York kind of lives, I you're surrounded by people that maybe have different levels of money and fame. And, and I'd often look at that and, and just sort of wonder about the emptiness of it. And... I always found that I could relate so much more to, you know, to the women in Afghanistan that were, you know, going through hardships or sitting on the floor than I could to people in uh, Venice Beach with a $12 green juice sitting, you know, I, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around that. That just didn't make yeah. any sense to me. And I, I much preferred, there's a, there's an authenticity about these people. And something that I really appreciated too was, I felt that so much in my in my life and as a journalist was was transactional. So people always wanted something from you or you were sort of the token, uh, she works for, you know, you weren't just, I wasn't just Holly, it was Holly at Fox or, you know, the, yeah. there's this sort of additive that comes to everything every time you're introduced, which really annoyed me. And then there's everything felt very transactional. 
aside from a very small group of friends who don't want anything from you. But but what I loved about working in these places is you you meet people who really share a story with you and they share some really intimate and horrific things that have happened to them and they don't want anything from you. They don't expect you to give them money. They don't expect you to, you know, and, and they're just the most giving sort of human beings and you'll walk into a refugee camp and I'll be leaving and some little girl will come and give me the only orange that they, you know, have left in their tent because they have to give you a gift and I just it was just a really sort of eye-opening beautiful thing to see human beings just wanting to to give and to talk and to not expect anything in return it's incredibly humbling and it can reset your optic for how you view the rest of the world it's powerful I actually wish that everybody at some point in their life was forced to experience that because I think it would really round the edges on a lot of the energy that, in my opinion, is needlessly spent on things that don't fucking matter. 100%. And all that money you spend on the, the Starbucks lattes every every day, you know, what could you do with that? You could, by the end of the year, probably go on a really lovely, uh, you know, vacation somewhere or have some sort of wonderful life experience with Something, that. Something, for sure. Yeah. How close to the, uh, the front lines of war were you able to get? Uh, I mean, on each trip that I've been in, definitely... Um, I, I've gotten to the front lines in, in a lot of situations. I have always found it interesting, but usually more on the scale of the less interesting aspects of war, I guess, for, for me mm. personally and what I sought to cover. I found it interesting more in in understanding the things that soldiers would talk about or the way that they would think about their families or just sort of the, the waiting period, I guess, before any type of conflict happened. That's what I found interesting, to sort of sit there in the early morning while they were waiting for the bombing to start and mm -hmm. talk to them about their families or how long they'd been there. But I think from my perspective, I found it much more interesting away from what we call the bang bang yeah. and really the people that were just living these lives sort of on the periphery of it all. That's what I found to be more engaging, I guess. The bang bang is the price. Yeah. The impact it has on everybody else is the cost. Yeah. They're two very different things. Uh, and yeah, I look at it, at, I'll use myself for an example. What was the price of war for me? Time away from my family, deployments, you know, the people that I loved overseas. What was the cost? Um, living through the experience that I did, the decisions that it, I had to make, even though I chose that occupation, one of those choices led to those decisions, um, and the weight that it'll have, and that varies per person for the rest of your life. The, the price and cost are very, very different things. I wish as a country and as a decision makers, we spent more time on the cost than the price. I think it's probably the thing that's left off of the menu when the people sit down and talk about these things, what the country's going to do foreign policy. I think the price is on there. And the cost is often left off. Yeah, and that's definitely what I tried to sort of do with the book is to highlight that human toll and the consequences of that and what happens. What happens when the war doesn't want a war anymore? What happens when, you know, something is quote unquote liberated? Um, you know, what, how do families pick their lives back together? Yeah. You know, what happens in the shadows? And I think that's something that I, I wanted to bring to light and that I felt was was better suited to my skills than, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are going to be much better than I am at identifying the different uh, weapons being used and, you know, how many JDMs were dropped today and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's not my forte. My forte is to be able to go into a situation and just really sit and listen. And it's so, again, it's not about, you know, always asking the question and always talking and it's just a lot of listening, and I think we've lost that in journalism today. So often people want to be the story. Journalists want to go in and be the story, and that's the kiss of death. And people would always sort of want to come back and ask me about what was it like to be, you know, in a dangerous situation or in a suicide bombing. And I always felt, and I still feel very uncomfortable speaking about it, and not that I have a problem talking about it, but it's more... Who am I to ever go into a situation and act like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this, and this. When people are living through that every day, yeah. they're getting through that with their kids, with their family. You know, to me, that is incredible. You know, maybe I've, I've been in a, in a few, but that to me, that's not a story. What I went through is not a story. What they go through, that is the story. And I think... I've just seen it a lot. And the invent of social media, too, is this idea of, of journalists wanting to be the story. And this sort of defeats the purpose of what journalism is. We're supposed to go in there and be neutral observers of a situation. 
and um, you know certainly I do my best not to draw any attention to myself in that way but to be able to have a platform to you know tell the stories and to to really speak to the people there and again that's listening how did it feel to be near the front lines to really be, it be again another thing that's very hard to describe mm. unless you've been close the sound the smell the communication the movement the cadence the pace of all of those things that happened and i say that from somebody who has taught to do those things over nearly two decades and for me it's still hard to describe what that actually feels like i mean maybe you have a totally fresh context on it so i'm curious how that felt being that close to it i think it for me it was almost a strangely a strangely calming experience in a, in a funny way and i say that because it obviously wasn't my job to have to fire a weapon in the you know and and hit a precision target and all of that it was my job again to observe and you really are in a situation where nothing else matters except what you're doing right then and there and you can't be thinking about the bills you have to pay at home and um, you know what you're going to have for dinner and you know whatever else you really are in and it's a rare it's a rare thing in today's very distracted society to just have to have nothing but a clear focus and that's what I found to be in a strange way calming for me and I think that's why I've gravitated to doing the work because I'm not somebody who, I think you have to have a natural sense of fear, don't get me wrong, I mm -hmm. think you know we all have a natural sense of fear, but to not panic or to not want to run away or to not want to, I think for me, it was just a sort of very black and white experience almost of you're either here or you're not. And, and I knew that I'd made a, a voluntary decision to be there. Nobody had forced me to be there. I didn't have to be there. I was under no obligation to be there, but I'd made that decision and I had to embrace that I'd made that decision. And I think that's always easier for you to do than, than people who love you, who um, are often the ones that are, are, are panicked for you, I guess. So for me, I just found it was, it really brought out the things that we think about as, as human beings that are the most important. And and I found that to be, yeah, strangely serene. Do you ever miss it? A hundred percent every day. Same here. Every day. I think about, you know, I can't, you know, I often think, well, where am I going next? What am I doing? What is the next chapter? I don't know. I mean, I'll always write and I'll always be very vested in foreign affairs, but do, will I still be covering war? Will I be covering a different kind of war? Will I be covering a cold war? Um, but I would go back in a you know, heartbeat to any of those places. And I, and it's not an adrenaline thing. I think that's often a misnomer um, for journalists. People tend to, to pinpoint it as sort of an adrenaline junkie. And I never found that for me. I think, you know, there is an adrenaline. I'm not going to deny that it exists. But it's, it's sort of this incredibly fast bonding experience I think that I found with people so I came from my life you know in the US where uh, I have some great friends but obviously my family is still in Australia and so it's almost a lonely life to a degree because you are living you're working you're living your own life you're traveling and then I would be in these places where people who never knew you from a bar soap suddenly you were the most important person in their life and they take it their job of, of taking care of you so seriously and you have these incredibly fast bonding experiences and I, I think that's what I miss a lot is sort of being with people in those moments that you can't describe to people but there's just this sense of of protection and care about each other that it's very hard to replicate in any other situation very well put were you when you started reporting on ISIS I'm assuming before you went overseas, you had some idea of what the organization was. You'd probably heard the term before you, before you went over. Were you shocked at what you found when it came to the absolute savagery of what those individuals are capable of? Yes, and then I, I was shocked. I was shocked. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, when you're burning people in cages and. You know, for me, the Yazidis is something I take very personally is, you know, when you can just sort of 
take an entire you should village describe of what people. happened with them and where, where the yeah, Yazidis Yeah, so are from. the Yazidis generally, um, they live on a, a mount, Mount Sinjar, in and around that area. They're a very ancient religion, and so they're sort of a blending of, of different forms of, of Christianity and of Islam, and they worship a Tawik, an angel. Um, so ISIS considers them devil worshippers, and so they justified uh, taking these women but and men too. They came into the village, it was August in 2014, surrounded the base of the mountain and unbeknown to the Yazidis who were all disarmed because both the Iraqi army and the Peshmerga had run away and so they were sort of sitting ducks when ISIS came in and really had nowhere to go. So a lot of them were obviously killed at the base of the mountain. Men, I mean, they were just lining up men and, and, and executing them. The women often were taken as sex slaves and what I found to be so heartbreaking was that many of them had nowhere else to go but up the mountain. And we're talking Iraq in August. It is What she's brutal. saying is it's not cold. Brutal. <laughs> and the crazy thing was, I mean, you had people, as we were watching it necessarily on TV, just starving and, and dying of dehydration. You had women that were throwing their babies over the mountain because that was going to be a better way to die than to die of... At the hands of ISIS. Yeah, yeah, or to die of starvation. And I thought with all this modern technology that we have... Um, and we couldn't really do anything about it. You know, I think the Brits started doing some drops, some food drops and, and water drops in the area, but it was fairly limited at that point. And it was really that moment that brought the U.S. back into Iraq, because prior to that, Obama was still calling them the, J- the JV team. And we weren't, you know, he was determined that we'd gotten out in 2011. We weren't going back. And then after that, it was just like, we cannot let this continue. Um, and there's such, you know, beautiful, sweet very peaceful people that were minding their own business in their village and and this happened to them and the thousands are still missing you know thousands will never never come back and yeah they'll be unfortunately probably missing till the end of eternity and what's crazy to me is that and this is something i've done a lot of investigative work on is so many of those women have been or the boys as well because they took a lot of the, the young boys and brainwashed them and they gave them Islamic names and told them they weren't Yazidi and um, all of that. But now these people have essentially been given new identities and moved in with families. And a lot of them are in Turkey and other places. And so you have a lot of these Yazidis and these, you know, women and little boys that have been brainwashed into this group or brainwashed as a wife or whatever it is. And and they're still out there and yet have no recourse of they've been given entirely new identities and, and little recourse of ever being found and and a lot of the boys I think are in jail and are probably being executed as fighters but you know, they were taken as, as children and so it's really hard it's a hard stomach it's a really hard stomach especially when you start talking about the methodology that they use whether it be the drugs that you yeah. guys were Cap- talking about yeah. what was the name of it Captagone Captagone, yeah, which was a combination of methamphetamine and what else was it? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. It was methamphetamines, and it mostly came from Iraq and Syria. I have to. I'm blanking on the other, the other ingredient, but nothing yeah. paired with meth is good, from my yeah. limited understanding. Yeah, so. it was mostly, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an upper and a huge, huge yeah. one. So, and they're giving it to all these young kids, and and they're going out to the battlefield, absolutely willing to die, and 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 take as many bullets as necessary, and just shoot like crazy animals. Um, Sometimes back at their own families. Yeah. I would imagine, depending on how, how long ago they were taken or when they were taken. And that's something that, you know, people say, well, 10,000 ISIS fighters were killed. It's like, okay, let's talk about this for a second. How many of those people that were killed are in that category? Kidnapped early on, brainwashed, didn't start out as somebody who was a true believer, hopped up on fill in the blank. And that's not a new thing when it comes to warfare, whether it be... Somalis chewing on cot, you know, for the Black Hawk Down yeah. type incident. They gave us uppers and downers. To stay awake was the justification. But I will tell you right now, it does it modifies your headspace for sure. You feel like your hair's on fire and you're like, fuck it, I'm charging to 50 cal today. Yeah. Not that that ever happened, but I think if the pre- situation presented itself, I don't still don't think I would have done it, but you would have viewed it differently because you're in a modified headspace. Those people, the people that you're talking about, like I said, the kidnapped, the brainwash, they're hopped up. If you kill 10,000 of those people and zero of the ones who are the devoutly, just incredibly devout, and it is their entire goal to recruit, we're not actually making an impact. Yeah. It, so it, it again, numbers mean something, but it has to be the right numbers. And I don't know, uh, 
I don't know if people pay attention to that. Uh, you got you and Jocko talked about the recruitment and the Western women wanting to go and be wives and leaving their families or going with their husbands and then their husband gets killed and it's like, hey, well, here's your next husband. I mean, it's it's more complex than people believe, I guess is the point I'm getting 100%, to. 100%, yeah. And I think to uh, re- re- the issue of religion is a factor, not the factor. Yeah. So it, it for, some, for many who are true believers, they will, um, you know, that's that's their motivation. But it's kind of one of five motivations and, and we frame it here in a very simplistic term of, well, that is the motivation. And often I will say when we do see loan attacks in the United States or in the West, it usually is a religious motivation. Because those are the individuals mm-hmm. that are driven to Being do radicalized, that. yep. But when you're actually in that vortex where it is, is, is so prevalent, religion is usually not even one of the top three factors yeah. of joining. It's usually, again, I, I, I strongly stand by this idea of being pissed at your government and wanting to do whatever you can to find back. Sometimes it's just necessity. So if ISIS comes into your village and you're working in a bakery and they say, well, you know, we can either kill you or you can make $5 a month working in the bakery, you're probably just going to say, okay, I'm going to keep my job. Now I have a new boss. Um, and, you know, so some of it's just pure necessity of, of survival. Afghanistan is a great example of that. Yeah. You can go back through the history of Afghanistan kind of as far as, as you want to, and it can be it can be bluntly described in that country, from my perspective at least, that they have lived under the rule of the thumb or a stick or an axe or a sword really far back. And first off, you need to survive before you're going to thrive. And you will see a shifting of allegiance throughout the course of that. I completely agree with you. It's it's a poor man's description to say that this is only religiously ideologi- ideologically based. I think that I think it would for most people be farther down the rung. I think it would shock people actually how far down the rung it normally is. Yeah. That most devout fighters though that I I would and I say this based off of like probably more of the things that we found on them, whether it be a journal or the videos or fill in the blank, the most committed fighters were the ones that had that ideological root to it from a religious perspective, but they were so few and far between. Yeah, they were not, they were the exception, not the norm. By a substantial margin. Yeah, like I, in the book, I, I talk about interviewing one of the head uh, IED makers for ISIS. He was recruited and was making all the car bombs and things and and you know, suicide vests and and I said to him, well, would you go? I mean, is it what? Would you strap a vest to yourself? Are you ready? He's like, oh, absolutely not. You know, he's not. But I'll make him for you. What yeah. size are you? Yeah, he's like, I don't have that <laughs> level of faith yet. And I thought, well, here you are, you know, strapping vests onto people to go to a quote unquote paradise, but you're certainly in, in no means willing to do that yourself. So. I think, um, yeah, that to me was sort of just the exemplification of the reason people are, are joining it. And it was often money and and a lot of ISIS, especially in the beginning and, and why they were so strong in the beginning were Saddam's generals, Saddam's military, who the U.S. debathed, quote unquote. And when you leave yeah. a whole bunch of angry men with their weapons on the street and no jobs and, and no sort of political allegiance, they're going to get pretty mad, too. Um, and then I think we really underestimated just how far the Shia would take their sudden, you know, moment in power after being oppressed by Saddam, who was Sunni at the time. And I think the U.S. just completely underestimated the degree to which they were going to to toot their own horn. And you ended up with the same problem in reverse. So just. I don't think many understand how e- the Sunni and Shia even tie into the religion of Islam or where they came from or you know, the disagreement when it comes all the way back to the days of Muhammad, where that initial yeah. split came from. I have a limited understanding of it because I was curious. And I, so I went and explored it on my own. That was not something that I was taught when I was in the military. So again, it's there's varying levels of understanding. And I, if I'm being totally honest, I don't think... It was it was after I got out of the military that I had more interest in that and, and having an understanding of them. It wasn't even during the time period that I was going over there and and being, you know, as a member of the U.S. Milita- military deploying to that area. So it's it's complex. Yeah. And it, and most of them are Sunni, 90 percent, I believe. Yep. And but Iran is the leader of the Shia. So that's sort of where that 
vortex comes in of the Iran versus Saudi Arabia? Yeah. No, it's very if it, once you develop a little bit of a better understanding of the Sunni Shia rift and the geography there, it makes a touch more sense. Mm. Not saying that it describes everything in perfect detail, but like I was saying, my optics shifted when I was listening to you and Jaco talk and started viewing our own country through perceived corruption or real in the decisions. It's like, okay, I the pieces now are less vague to me. I still can't connect them a lot of the times conceptually, but it's a little bit of a better understanding. Well, you can see where things can start. I mean... At the very least, you yeah. can see where, like, oh, maybe this is the inception or origin. Maybe this, I don't know what this would look like in 10 years, but holy shit. Yeah. Could it look like that? Maybe. Probably yeah. depends on how far uh, that perceived corruption goes. Yeah. And or the actual corruption. And another thing that I've thought a lot about, especially in covering Venezuela and other places, but you could, you could almost apply it to the Middle East in a murky way, Syria at least, is when you have an authoritarian government who has deliberately unarmed a population, what degree does, and I, and I try to sort of try to point this out to my friends who are very pro-gun control, is you can then pray essentially, or you can know that you can oppress an entire group of people because they've been unarmed. Whereas sometimes the idea of a population being able to defend themselves is a huge deterrence, you know, and I think a lot of my Venezuelan friends will will tell me that in Venezuela, which was a country where you could own arms, yeah. and then over the course of Chavez's time, he started to do buyback schemes and other things, and by around 2012, I think, just before he died, it was sort of a blanket. No one is allowed to, to own a gun and the government's going to protect you. Well, sure enough, Maduro came to power and what happened? You know, these peaceful protests were completely annihilated, and a lot of Venezuelans, I think, look back at that now with regret and say, you know, not that, I mean, it could have been a complete extra bloodbath, you know, had the citizens been able to defend themselves, but you could have also looked at it saying the government, you know, they may not have taken the action that they take. Potentially change their decisions. Yeah. If you look back at history for totalitarian regimes, one of the first things that they generally try to do is disarm the populace. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not accidental that that repeats itself over time. Yeah, and I think that's that's often missed in the argument that when you know when people are fighting, well it's a slippery slope when you have this control and that control and this control, you know, where where does that slippery slope end? And I and I seen that play out in, you know, even in Mexico and other places. And Mexico is one of the three countries in the world that has in their constitution that you are allowed to own guns. Well, they make it so hard for anyone to legally purchase a gun there um, so that sort of enables the cartels and, and other groups to to have free reign over that population and I just think you know I don't know that that works in the least but again Afghanistan, Iraq those places you aren't legally allowed to go into a gun store and, and buy a gun you have to have some sort of military purpose to do that and yet time and time again we've seen the own government oppressing its people Yeah what was it like sitting across from an ISIS fighter, somebody who believed in that ideology and mm -hmm. having a conversation with them or an interview, however you would want to describe it? I think the first time for me, uh, that was in 2014. So it was still a very relatively new concept. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what to expect. And you, know, you sort of had, there were two young guys that came in and I was, I mean, first of all, you sort of have these impish-looking human beings, and one of them had killed seventy people. And I thought, how does this guy do that? And he only had he only had one hand because I guess he stole something, and they chopped one of his hands off. So then he had to learn to shoot with the other side. And so it was just sort of a fascinating. It was really sad in some ways because you thought these young people that kind of got swept up into something, and now they've ruined their lives. They've probably been executed since then. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in one case, the guy that had killed 70 had been forced into a marriage. Who, he didn't know the woman and she turned out to have something wrong with her, he said, and tried to run away. Couldn't go back to his family because couldn't pay. Then his family had to pay the dowry, which he knew that they couldn't afford. Sort of poor family. Went back to land in Mosul and ISIS came in and said, well, if you're going to stay here, you've got to fight for us. Um, so that was kind of his foray in. And then he, he got, I guess, scared or wanted to get out and tried to do a runner up north and got busted and they took him in. And yeah, it, just, it was sad to me that somebody had obviously killed a lot of people, but had just made those sort of life decisions, I think, that were in a difficult situation. And 
I wanted to go in there and really hate all the you know hate both of them and mm-hmm. and I and I remember on that car ride back afterwards feeling angry at myself that I even had any sort of depth of understanding of what they went through because I, I definitely think they're evil and horrible human beings who did a lot of horrible things but at the same time it's not black and white I can't look at somebody and hear their story and not to some degree, have something that I can understand about that story. How did he talk about killing those 70 people? Was it matter of fact? Was it, was it, was, it even something that hit his radar scope as, I don't know, abnormal? I think him, for him, yeah, he wasn't a hugely empathetic creature. I'm not, you know. Empathy is a sliding scale. Yeah. And people need to understand that. He, Some was, people he are... was quite matter of fact about it. <clears throat> um, yeah, he was pretty, he was pretty, uh, I wouldn't say he was boastful, but he was pretty matter of fact about what he'd done. Remorseful at all? I wouldn't say particularly remorseful, no. Was that a theme at all with some of the people that you had sat down? How many ISIS uh, fighters or people that have sworn their allegiance to that ideology have you sat down and spoken to? I think uh, overall, um, probably about a dozen. And then I wrote probably about half a dozen in the book. Similarities between them that you saw? Again, I'd say I don't know that any of them joined for first and foremost, except for the European fighter that I'd interviewed, joined for religious reasons. Um, there was a guy from Belgium who I think was sort of indoctrinated or he he grew up in Morocco and I think he was probably the only extremist that had made the effort to to go across the world to do that. But the others, you know, impoverished families, I think, um, limited education, limited financing um, and just sort of saw it as a window of opportunity in their lives. So I'd say that's definitely a similarity. I found most of them to be, um, you had sort of two camps. You had ones that were were quite sorry for what they'd done and were clearly trying to curry favour and apologise and and then you had the other camp that you could tell were maybe rehearsing lines of I'm sorry but didn't mean it. Yeah. So, and it was usually no one really in the middle that was kind of, uh, they were the ones that you knew would be back on a battlefield if they'd had the opportunity. And then other ones that were clearly like, I, I really fucked up and I'm sorry. And I would encourage people not to join this group and genuinely mean it. The path for the gentleman who came from Europe, how was he, how was he radicalized? What did, what did that journey look like for him? Where did it start? So he, uh, so he, he's Moroccan family, you know, grew up, I think fairly moderate. Uh, he was part of a group. It was called free, free Sharia in Belgium or something. And it was funny because they only really just outlawed this group, but this group was extremely radical group that was very freely, um, you know, espousing their thoughts in Belgium and radicalizing each other and someone had told him go and join Al-Qaeda and I think a lot of it was motivated by what was happening in Syria with the war with the Bashar al-Assad regime cracking down on protesters there and a lot of them were extremely incensed by that and that was the initial idea for him to to go over there and he found that he could travel I think without a passport and just have ID and so he was up and gone hmm. immediately and it was a guy who was working at DHL or some you know very standard delivery job ended up in Turkey going through Turkey you know they meet up with these people online um, who smuggle them into Syria and this was the pre-ISIS day I think he went in around 2013 when it was still Al-Qaeda and then when that split kind of happened around that time he ended up going in the ISIS path that way and and I think he really saw it as his mission to fight the Assad regime. Did you ever have the opportunity to interview have conversations with female ISIS fighters? I did. So I had a conversation with a couple of them in Syria. Um, again, sort of a similar I mean, the women weren't fighting, so to speak, but the women were kind of the supporters, the enablers. Mm-hmm. And often something that I think is you know, incredibly horrific is they were the ones really grooming these Yazidi women. So we cannot look at these women and think that they're somehow innocent or caught up in... What do you mean by grooming? So these women, and, and it's just... Her- so they would take the Yazidis, buy them at a market, um, and... Buy them at a market? Yes. Yeah, so they were... You know, An ISIS-run market? Yeah, so the women say, yeah. were being sold as sex slaves or, or taken and, and chosen um, you know, by the Wallis and the leaders and, and different echelons. And then 
the wives of the ISIS fighters were the ones that were sort of essentially responsible for putting makeup on them and sort of grooming them to be raped. And that to me is just, it's it's absolute disgusting. So I think that when we look at, there's this sort of idea of wanting to look at these women as being innocent human beings, or they weren't on the front line killing people, so therefore they should be, you know, somehow exempt or returned to their country or put in some kind of re, you know, rehabilitation program and I think in a lot of cases no these women were doing just as evil things as killing people um, I almost think it's yeah. more savage than killing people absolutely. just listening to the description of the grooming and facilitating absolutely fuck that is a yeah. level of evil that ugh. yeah and then one of the women and, and you know, the other thing I found was that ISIS would often recruit women that clearly had mental problems so um, a lot how would they do that though I think you just prey on the vulnerable, really. I remember one of the ISIS women that I talked to, uh, she she was schizophrenic, and it was quite evident because when I was sitting there, one minute she was laughing, and the next minute she was crying, and the next minute she'd be, you know, trying to grab me, and then the next minute, you know, she was telling me how much she loved the jail. And so it was just this very bizarre experience of absolute extremities. Um, but, you know, she you know, pretended to be this very innocent, oh, I, I got recruited by the driver and then my husband was going to divorce me and I didn't know what to do. So I joined this group and I wanted some money and she was in Kirkuk. And then she ended up getting caught. But she was one of the you know huge enablers for the Yazidi sex slaves. She was one of the ones that were going in the market and grabbing the girls with the with the fighters and, and sort of grooming them and abusing them too. You know, there was huge levels of Yeah, abuse. torture is... Yep is i mean it sounded like in some of the stories <clears throat> jock was reading through the sections of the book and i mean for some people it was a daily occurrence yeah Cra- like you know let's just be hung from our feet with our hands tied and be beaten or put into a really isolated or small space so you're contorted i mean it's yeah it's horrendous yeah totally horrendous and and hard to I mean, some of the boys as well that were recruited into fighting, I mean, they still just have these permanent, their their rib cages are just black because of the level of torture that they had to sustain. It's hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to, for me, it's really something I'm very interested in and exploring a lot more is this idea of how you even survive that. You know, how you, how you survive just such extreme levels of torture and what is it that mentally, what mental headspace can you possibly get into that you can stand there and and be beaten and whipped senseless and have your fingers cut off, you know, for hours on end? How do you survive that? And I'm just so deeply curious. Very ordinary or people, or do yeah. you? You know, and and you could argue that sort of on a psychological level, you know, do you? But physically, you know, I've met many people, and this was something interesting that came up for me in the very beginning of covering ISIS when you had to have these conversations with people what happens if you get kidnapped and I remember being in a room with a couple of other US veterans and and myself and a couple of locals and every single one of them said well if I get kidnapped just shoot me and I think I was the only one who said oh I I u't shoot me <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stick it out because, is there another option yeah I so just, people are like do you want to get into a gunfight or a knife fight? yeah is there an option C that and it doesn't involve a gun or a knife I think so much of our human mind immediately goes to we can't I, I could never survive that so just I want to end it I don't want I don't want to be kidnapped I don't want that to happen I'd rather die and for me I found that to be no I'm if I can talk to ordinary people that have survived the most extraordinary things and they've lived to at least tell the tale, then I want that opportunity too. So that's something I've always been fairly That's an interesting adamant. headspace. Yeah, yeah. Was it, how much concern did you have for the probability or uh, realistic nature that you were in, an, in a place where they might value kidnapping you? Was huh. it something you were concerned about pretty constantly? <laughs> I wouldn't say I was pretty constantly concerned about it. I mean, it was certainly something you have in the back of your mind and um, and something you try to avoid. I'll never forget one time coming back from Sinjar Mountain and, and coming back to Abil and this long winding road and I'd end up falling asleep in the back and it was a Yazidi Peshmega guy driving and a friend of mine in the car and waking up and he'd taken a wrong turn and we were going into Mosul and there was the black flag right there and my heart just dropped because I thought, oh my goodness, like what are we doing? And and luckily there was like a kid, ISIS kid at the checkpoint and, and 
um, the guy was able to turn around and we were able to go back. But I think in that moment it was a little bit surreal because I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? I can't call anyone, you know. Um, so I think those things are always to a degree in the back of your mind but mm-hmm. but just from a personal perspective and maybe that's just because of the research and work I've done I've always been a lot more concerned about being taken by a government like a, a a state actor so the Syrian government or the Iranian government that to me has always been something that has concerned me more than being taken by a terrorist and I'm not sure why that's just you know, where my head's been in the past and I thought you know once one of those places takes you it can take 10 years for your government to fight to get you out if you're lucky. Um, and that was something I, I, I very much caused anxiety for me when I was traveling in those particular places. One of the more common themes, I hate to even call it that, with ISIS seems to be the sex slaves. Yeah. How does that fit into their ideology? So they basically justify that as as Yazidis being devil worshippers and or is it just the Yazidis or is it anybody that doesn't no, um, I mean, so fit with their ideology? You could definitely have rogue people that will, you know, and I have heard stories about Christians and other women mm. that have had that happen. Turk the Turkmen women is another group that are just have had a lot of missing women by ISIS and that they haven't come out to talk about it. And I have tried and I've gotten a couple of their leadership to admit, okay, well, we have a number of women missing, but they're so deeply conservative um, that they just, they, they, if those girls come back, they'll probably get stoned to death. And that's the sad reality of it is that the idea of them being taken by any sort of male entity, regardless of whatever it may or may not have even happened, mm-hmm. they can never come back. And those women usually end up not wanting to come back anyway. So they won't try to escape or they'll kill themselves because they know that there's just no future for them after that. And that to me is an incredibly sad uh, situation. So the Yazidis really broke a mold when they came and, and started to talk about what had happened because up until that point, you have these deeply conservative cultures who typically won't talk about it at all. And a lot of Muslim women that have had that happen to them, they won't talk about it because that will, you know, cut them out of getting married or their, their lives will just be over or they do risk, you know, being honor killed by their own family. So what the Yazidis did was incredibly brave because they came out very early in the beginning when some of them were being rescued and, and spoke to the international community about what's happening and it was it was quite incredible to see but ISIS does justify them as these devil worshippers and um, you know ISIS is a very organized group they had in, you know piles and piles of doctrines explaining exactly what they could and couldn't do hmm. and so that was sort of all part of it but you had to take them as a wife quote unquote so you had to sort of stand there for two seconds and say you are my wife not that she had any um, consent say in, the in matter. that no yeah. but that was their justification of it and um, and then they would often sort of sell them and then they get a new wife or um, sort of that was their process in that. And the Yazidis were really, I mean, there were just thousands of them that were taken. And I interviewed many of the girls that were, were taken and they're just extraordinarily brave in telling their stories. And um, and I guess their hope was that something would change. I think if they keep telling their story, something can change. Or if people pay attention to what they're saying, the depravity of that situation or the choices involved in that, again, exceeds my vocabulary when it comes to ability to describe i can only imagine when they were taken that their life was a a life of torture and imprisonment absolutely how long um how long were they i'm assuming some tried to escape some were probably killed Mm -hmm. probably more than some yeah some killed themselves yeah i was just gonna say that some chose to kill themselves what percentage do you think survived that ballpark Oh, I do have exact figures. I think that I would say there was probably around at least 8,000 that was taken. And then I want to say two and a half have come back. And so there's still a whole chunk missing. And I really thought, you know, when when they announced the Mosul liberation and I was there and I, I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a great opportunity for the girls to get out and they're going to be free. And really very little, very few came out of that. And that was that was crazy to me because I expected that there was going to be dozens, if not hundreds, that were going to be freed. 
and they just they weren't. So they were either killed in that fighting. A lot of them were killed in that fighting too, you know, and yeah. I think they were essentially human shields. Um, and so when you're in a house full of ISIS fighters, and I talked to women, I, I talked to one Yazidi woman who was a sex slave, and I don't know if you remember, there was a, I think it was a Delta Force group that went into Syria and were like having hand-to-hand combat with some of the fighters, and it sort of made a big news splash here because of the, I guess, the nature of the fighting and what had happened. And, and months later, I interviewed her, and she'd been able to get out and was at a refugee camp or IDP camp in northern Iraq and she said I saw that she's like I was in the house I saw that happening and I was trying to get someone's attention but not that there was anything I'm sure that the Americans really could have done yeah. at that point anyway but it was just fascinating to hear something that I'd seen all over the news and we'd all read about and then to have her sort of sit there and say I was just begging for someone to help me but and not being able to be helped and then a lot of the girls were showing me you know, shrapnel marks and things that they'd had in the back of their head because the house they were in was bombed. And I don't know by who. It could have been Syrians. It could have been mm. Iraqis, Americans. I don't know. But they were sort of in the middle of it. And I thought, well, that's going to be really difficult to avoid. Well, it may be impossible to avoid yeah. because we're not the only people who understand our rules of engagement yeah. or the the boundaries that we try to put on War. You and Jocka talked about absolute war. Mm -hmm. The U.S., I actually agree with Jocka a little bit. The dropping of the atomic bombs, that was about as close to like, hey, hold my beer. Everything is is on the menu that I think the U.S. has gone to. In Iraq and Afghanistan, I had very precise ROEs. Uh, Mosques, almost always off limits. Hospitals, treated as exactly that. Hospitals, ambulances, Red Cross, all of those things. It doesn't take a genius to figure out the seams in your enemy or opponent's strategy or limitations. Mm. So we started, you know, yeah, they'd get in cars with kids Mm -hmm. and women. And we could, uh, even way back in the day, track a handset. But are you willing to send a Hellfire missile into a car of women and kids to kill one individual? I'm not, I've never been at a level where that value uh, right. mathematical right. decision needs to be made or what I don't even know what the threshold necessarily is. But it, it's impossible, I would imagine, for these women Especially to avoid Especially for urban, urban fighting. They're I mean, going to drag yeah. you in. They're going to put you in front of the windows. Yep. They're going to have you sleeping in the same rooms as them. It's it, And it can get much more complex than that. And I'm not even going to add the other things that I've seen because I don't want to give anybody ideas. But it could become impossible for them because yeah. the people that we're trying to find and eradicate, they understand the rules that we have to operate in. One of the most fascinating things I saw was sitting on Sinjar Mountain when it was not long after the Mosul liberation had kind of started and just watching back to back traffic of ISIS vehicles, families moving from Mosul into Raqqa, into Syria, along this sort of one road. And I just remember sitting there and we're just watching it. And, and I'm sure, you know, the guys and we're all sort of sitting there watching it as well and there was just nothing they could do because they were all families and I just thought you know here's your absolute you know probably the leadership that's sitting right there in plain sight in front of me driving along this road and there's just nothing anyone can do no one's going to drop a bomb because they're all full of kids there I'm glad that we didn't drop a bomb there though there has to be a difference yeah um, and because again, I, there's a question I will get asked. Well, what's the difference between you and you know the people that you were fighting? And I mean, you've interviewed U.S. servicemen and women. I'm assuming. Yeah, hundred percent. Similarities and differences that you found between U.S. servicemen and women and ISIS fighters, male and female. Did you find any similarities between the two, or was it more defined by their differences? Um, I would say it was more defined by. But defined by differences, but if you're going to talk similarities, you have to believe what you're doing is right to a degree. You know, and I think that's where ISIS differs. I mean, not that the U.S. soldiers definitely believe they're, they're fi- they believed in their fight and they believe what they're fighting for, but I think there's been a lot of disillusionment over the last two decades. It's a sliding scale for sure. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think ISIS, to whatever degree, they believe in their their mission and their fight and and. I think that that has that has been an issue. I think a little bit with the U.S. soldiers. However, I would caveat that by saying, I think one of the big reasons that ISIS was eliminated, not eliminated in a, a physical sense, but at least by territory, um, in 2017, was because 
Trump did come in and say, this is the mandate, get rid of ISIS militarily. It wasn't, let's fight Iran. It wasn't, let's fight Bashar. It wasn't, you know, come, let's build a nation. Let's, you know, clear it wasn't mission, that. It was a, a very clear mission. mission. Yep. And all the generals on the ground that I'd interviewed at the time were like, that's what we needed. We needed a clear mission and and uh, basically the the free hand to go and do that. And I think, you know, in their perspective, when I interviewed them, that was what they felt they'd gotten and that was what enabled them to, to fairly quickly see that ISIS was run out of Mosul and Raqqa and at least taken in a in a territorial sense. Yeah, from a geographic perspective, yeah. we took back their territory. So I think when, when you do have those clear mandates, I think that definitely helped. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I hate, I hate to equate any sort of U.S. with with what ISIS was doing. Well, and, and it wasn't an yeah. attempt to do that. People who fight for a living, sure. whether they enlist and they want to be issued a uniform or they become radicalized or they find a purpose that they want to fight for, I wouldn't be surprised if there mm. were similarities. You know, depth of belief does not necessarily equate to legitimacy of belief in right. my mind. And because, again, when I asked you about, you know, evil, the preying upon those. Um, and then the belief, I would say, for most U.S. service members is they want to go and prevent that from happening. Mm. They can equally believe that, that that depth equally. I don't have an issue with that. Mm. that I feel that there are two very different uh, values that are placed on those beliefs. One, to protect and ensure that you know what the other individual, male or female, is trying to, doing, trying to do doesn't happen. Right. I wouldn't have been surprised if you said that they, uh, the U.S. soldiers, at least from a a depth of belief perspective, it probably is actually very similar. Mm. Depending. Right, depending. And what I found too in my, when I'm able to have those very one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, maybe outside sort of the military uh, military environment, is really the level of compassion that, you know, a lot of the U.S. soldiers and, and sailors and things have for the people on the ground and the situation and the the frustrations of, of, of wanting to do the right thing and wanting to help people that are oppressed and in really challenging situations in life and 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 sort of hopefully seeing some of what they do as, as part of that mission, even though it, it does involve combat and killing and other things, there's this, this sense of wanting to do what's right. And I found that that's been a very constant theme too. And, and even talking about, it's funny, I bring up, I spent a little bit of time going and in, in touring uh, Sada City with the Mahadi Ami. And even though they're kind of the enemy of, uh, you know, the U.S. and, and the cost of, of lives in, in Sada City and Baghdad was horrific. But every person I know who served in Sada City just, just it stays with them. And they talk about the smell and, you know, and and, the, and things, but there, there's a sort of uncanny, and you can probably speak to this, an uncanny love for this place because even though they hated it, it defined so much of of their lives and and their fighting, yeah, and it left this sort of incredible mark. So, I think there's this duality of of loving and hating a place at the same time. Jocko would call that a dichotomy, um, which is his favorite <laughs> word, and I feel like he should get a tattoo, not on his forehead, but somewhere. No, he uses it well, and he uses it often because they're everywhere. Yeah, and that is war itself. I think. It's a, yeah. the best and the worst of, of humanity. It's, it brings out the best and, and the worst of what we as humans can do for each other. Do you think, and this is more speaking from using, <clears throat> I would, not speaking from, but using the example of somebody who has been radicalized versus, well, they could have been recruited, uh, kidnapped, and then brainwashed. Mm -hmm. So a radicalized ISIS believer. Do you think it's possible through education or means other than taking their life to reorient their opinion on their beliefs? I do. I do. And that's to say for everyone, not um, sort of that rehabilitation process isn't going to be for everyone. There are going to be people that are way too far down that line to, uh, to be brought back to earth. But there are many who I think sort of with the right program it just depends do you want to invest in that mm -hmm. and i'd say with the iraqis they were so damn pissed off about what had happened with isis and they were not they, there was no mercy there they were having you know very short very quick trials and and basically sending guys out do to we the need gallows. to use air quotes for the yeah. trial <laughs> yeah <laughs> i the, feel like perhaps the yeah. verdict might have been preordained before it began totally and there was just no there was just, they were done there was going to be no sense of compassion and based off of what ISIS did when they 
I yeah, mean, just the at and, a very and, deep level, I can understand that. And really, how many Iraqi soldiers had sacrificed their lives in that fight? And I think we overlooked that a little bit, or a lot. Is just, I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of, and they actually I think had to hide the numbers because they were so high because yeah. it would destroy morale of how many of these Iraqi um, soldiers that were killed in the fight, and and that rightfully so. Um, they were pretty pissed off about anything to do with ISIS and there was going to be no mercy at all there and, and they certainly had no interest. In, and that's one thing that a lot of them have brought up with me in the past is, well, why are, you, why are Americans trying to do these rehab programs for these people? We don't understand this. Just, you know, this is silly. Why would you spend money on that? And to them it's, you know, it's weighing up what the what they see as the importance of a human life and, and I guess how we see it in a slightly different frame. There, There is a difference, at least in my own experience mm-hmm. and in the conversations and it, the things that I've physically seen expressed, the beliefs physically expressed. There is a, a difference. And even actually, honestly, how they fight. Um, I've watched them shoot. Well, again, I can't say I ever encountered somebody who was ISIS. Uh, Al-Qaeda, probably a different story. I've watched them shoot through their own fighters to attempt to injure Americans. There's just a, it's a different value in life and the mm. way that they conduct themselves on the battlefield. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I prefer our particular approach to that as opposed yeah. to theirs, but I'm not trying to make a value judgment on it. But I think they've grown a lot. And that's something that I, I think that's been sort of nice to see in the from the beginning toward the end is how, I mean, obviously with the amount of experience they had, but in the beginning... I think a lot of the the Iraqi fighters I talked to really didn't know what they were fighting for, or who they were fighting, or you know, it was a kind of a paycheck. Whereas by the end of it, I saw a much more cohesive sense of we're fighting for Iraq. Yeah. And to me, that was finally a nice thing to see because you know, if you if you aren't fighting for something, you're fighting for nothing. So to sort of see that evolution, I think by the end of it was was quite profound. Well, without that evolution, they would never be able to do it on their own. Absolutely. You have to have that deeper level of belief and understanding and purpose and mission. Otherwise, war will fucking grind you up and spit you out because Mm -hmm. there is a cost to it that is huge. Yeah. And that's one thing I really observed in Yemen. And I think why we're seeing that conflict continue to go on and why the Houthis are so strong is because they're fighting and they're Iran backed and they're fighting for their, they're a militia and they're fighting for their, their purpose and, and, Whereas the sort of Yemenis are this kind of ragtag, we don't really know, we just want our caught, we want to wake up at 11 and then, you know, stay up all night and chew and then maybe fire a few things and leave. And I always got the sense working there that they never knew what they were fighting for. And so it really doesn't surprise me uh, six years on that they're still not really anywhere with that war. And because I think Yemen doesn't know what Yemen is fighting for. Yeah. How many trips have you done as a journalist to war zones? Do you have a I've ballpark? Never counted. Um, Spitball here. What do you think? I mean, it depends because a lot of it's not war zone either. A lot yeah. of it might be, you know, Venezuela or other other places. Um, I guess you know, twenty or so, twenty twenty five. Had to calculate it all. Out of all those twenty to twenty five, or not out, of, not out of all of those, but in all of those trips and the experiences that you have had. Can you point to something that has robbed you of a little bit of faith in humanity, something that sticks with you like, oh, shit, maybe we're not so well off as a species? I think there are many, unfortunately. Um, I think for me, there was a moment that just absolutely broke me, and that was in Sinjar City after it had been liberated. And I was sort of living there. No one was able to live there because it was still, you know, it was full of uh, trip wires everywhere, full of ideas. And I was just with a small Yazidi Pashmaka group sleeping on a roof. And I remember kind of going through the town and then seeing this man one time was just living in this bombed out house. And there were two little kids. And I just said, you know, stop the vehicle. I want to talk to this guy. And I went out and I sat with him on this totally broken down porch. And he started to explain to me that he you know was a poor farmer his wife had been taken as a sex slave and so he had the two kids and 
he couldn't afford to stay at the, the refugee camp anymore because, you know, there was trouble and they needed some, you know, he just wanted to be back in his home. And his home had nothing, um, had no electricity, no water, and it was mostly rubble, but little enough structure had survived to stay there. And so he'd come back and he was just so broken. And, and he said that and the ISIS captor, which they often do, would call and say, well, I have your wife here. And if you pay me $15,000, I will you know, send her back to you. So this guy had just gone around his village and was raising money and was selling his sheep and whatever he had to get the his wife, the mother of his children back. And it took him months. And finally, he was able to call the fighter back and say, okay, I have the money. And the fighter says, oh, well, it's doubled now. And he knew that he, there's just no way he would be able to do that and raise that money again. And who knows what would happen or how long that would take. And it, it broke me because... I knew I couldn't help him because, and I couldn't ask anyone to help him. I couldn't start a GoFundMe. I couldn't ask an NGO. There was nothing I could do because that would be supporting terrorism if I, you know, tried if to do fu- that. Yeah, indirectly funding Yeah. It. So I just, I remember that was a part of me that I felt absolutely broken because- The helplessness? The helplessness. And I just felt completely wasted by the helplessness. And these two little children who would grow up without a mom or any type of resource and they were living in this awful place. And I just thought, how sad is that? This guy just, he'd done everything he could. He'd given up everything he could to try to get his wife back and and it just became a hopeless mission and that nobody could really assist him on. And that was just heartbreaking to me. And I find that for me, moments like that uh, so weigh, weigh on me so much more than the you know, bang, digging, bang. yeah, the bang bang, or even div- digging up a mass grave, or something that that is horrific. But but death is death, and I think when the living are like the dead, there's something that's just incredibly haunting about that. And it's stories like that, and I often wonder about these people and and what lives they're living now, and and those things stay with me a lot more. I wonder if his wife was even alive to begin with, right? And yeah, there's really and the rescues are just such intricate challenging things and for all people involved in those yeah um but yeah that was just it was heartbreaking for me and i thought of the just the sheer helplessness what about the other side of the coin and all of your experiences what has stood out to you that restored your faith in humanity i think we can look at the same story (laughs) to a degree and say the people that were that were rallying around him to give him money and to support him it's that kind of community again that has given me faith and what people are willing to do for each other without anything in return. And I think that has always been extraordinary as well and in, in seeing that play out in many different ways. I know in another situation I was at a, a refugee camp and there was a, a woman who was pregnant and I guess it had gone the baby had gone really, really overdue and they didn't have access to medical resources and, and again you saw this sort of same rallying of people selling whatever they had in their tents, going down uh, you know, onto the corner and, and selling whatever little trinkets or whatever until they could raise enough money for the woman to be able to go to hospital and, and have her baby and I just thought it's little things like that that are just bringing the community together and that's all also what's restored my faith in humanity is the resilience and and meeting people who maybe this isn't the first time that they've run away from their had to run away from their home maybe it's the third or the fourth maybe they left in the iran iraq war and then left again during the u.s invasion and now again with isis and yet the willingness to go back and rebuild the willingness to go back and start their lives again with nothing and to be able to accept that it can happen again, to me, that's just remarkable. I think that will and that resilience is just something that I've learned a lot personally. When was the last time you went on a trip to a war zone? How long ago? Uh, I've, I mean, so I guess I've, I've covered a lot of cartel stuff over the last year, so I've sort of been doing different Mexico trips. Different type of war zone. Different type, but you know, <laughs> extremely, I would say, I would say in, in case, I would say case in point, cartels and a lot of what I see in Africa make the brutality of ISIS pale a little bit. Really? Yes. Yes. Well, you're going to have to unpack that for yes. me a touch. The level of, I mean, ISIS is a high scale brutality and then the stuff I've seen. Um, both in cartels in Africa, I always point to is if you look at some of the places in in Congo and things, I remember meeting people that had triplets and they have to run because otherwise 
if people find out that you've had triplets, they will sacrifice them. They will, you know, do some kind of ritual that is beyond me. Um, because they, because of the fact they were triplets. Yeah, just this is a lot of uh, like witch doctor type stuff that oh happens, boy. and it's it's really you know that's why you know, people with alopecia, you know, they have to yeah. to run to. So you see that all the time. The women and what they endure um, there is 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 crazy in terms of. I, know, I think it's the Congo where they, they they literally rape babies. <laughs> I mean, it's horrific. You have uh, one week old, and there's some incredible doctors, the Dr. McQuaggy, who won the Nobel Prize, who's there, and they will get one week babies brought into their clinic that have just. I mean, I, I can't even put it into words. And how can a human being do that? To I, I don't. Human I don't being? even know. You know, it's. It's just it's earth shattering to me. And then the women, you know, they'll have these children out of rape, and then. The children that have been born out of this rape are then subject to crazy sort of stigma and, and then their lives are, are upended as well. And even at a refugee camp, these different militia groups will come after them. And, and it, you know, some of these women are just the strongest human beings I've ever met that I just am in awe of, of what they are willing to, to How endure. How can you not be? Yeah. And it's, it's horrific. Um, and then similarly with the cartels, just the sort of – the the constant or the lack of, of concern in, in chopping up a body and sending it to someone's loved one is just dropping a, a body in a bath of acid or um, things like that that a lot of those small villages and, and places that have messed with the wrong person are subject to are also pretty unfathomable to me. Am I mistaken in the belief that cartels are nearly always tied to the drug trade in some way, shape, or form? In some way, shape, or form. Obviously, I think their, their business enterprise has expanded a lot beyond that, but at yeah. the, the nuts and bolts of it um, is... At a root cash level. Yeah, it started with drugs. And one thing I've been exploring a lot is the relationships between these labs in China that bring all the fentanyl... Um, precursors into Mexico and the sort of the relationship between these Chinese groups and the Mexican cartels, which is killing Americans. And it's something that's right on our doorstep with fentanyl and other things that are coming through and how that's coming through and how that relationship has really grown you know, a lot over the past eight or nine years. And it's it's something that hugely affects, affects all of us. I think we all know someone who's died of a, a counterfeit pill or or an overdose. Or, yeah, just had their life just inexplicably changed due to an addiction of some kind or, you know, just a catastrophic event involved oh, by it. Yeah. Are you going to write so. a book about what you're researching or reporting on? I've done a few different articles. I would like to um, – I'd like to include it in something in the future. I'm not sure what shape that's going to take at yet, but I think one thing, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm really exploring is this idea of survival. So – what are the, what is it that people are, um, what gets them through uh, these unfathomable situations? Is it is it faith? Is it family? Is it hope? Is it how do you pull through? You know, I have a good friend of mine, and she was held by Joseph Coney and for eight eight or nine years, and she had several children out of rape. And I, you know, I talk to her often. She just went back to Uganda, and. I just think, you know, how did you survive that? And not even just the own, you know, that that particular militia, but just the threat of other militias and the threat, the constant environment. And you were taken out of a boarding school at the age of 14 into this. And, and you know, how did you get through that? How did you escape? Like what, you know, and she went on and got a master's at Georgetown and just she's brilliant. And I just think, how do you, how do you live your life? after that and she's a real example of that to me and then someone else who I, I talked to and um, fairly often and recently wrote who I know that you know is Jessica Lynch mm -hmm. and she's someone I talked to and, and Jessica and I talked a couple of weeks ago about her life now and, and she's just this incredibly vivacious beautiful she's a, a student teacher in uh, West Virginia and she has her daughter and and just you know how she's able to pick up the pieces of her life and you know every day she's putting on the leg brace yeah. and every day she's reminded of you know what happened to her and 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 I just think you know what what is it that, that pulled you through you know how do you survive that and just become this beautiful human that you are today and she's just such an incredibly compassionate zero zero bitterness zero resentment just fully accepting of everything that happened to her and I just think that is something 
we can all learn from from people like her and people in Iraq and, and all parts of the world what is it that they get to get them through and I think when we tend to feel like or you know if I tend to feel like my world is falling apart because something very minor happened in comparison Wi-Fi slow yeah and I'm I'm <laughs> I, totally you know and I find myself falling into that trap we all you know? do it's like yeah god damn it I yep. only have 5g yeah this like, sucks I'm such and a- I can't download this damn photo yeah. right now and I need to send it to someone I'll have those moments I'm like yeah I'll go find a mirror and just look at myself like you yep. are a piece of shit you need to go, you need to recalibrate yourself. Totally. <laughs> and so I wanted to do a book in that realm and not because I want it to be dark and depressing, but because I actually want it to be a little bit, you know, give us all a little bit of hope of what is it that we can draw upon in situations that is that human instinct for survival. And I, and I see many great survival books that are out there, but they're all often by very trained people or people that are kind of doing masochistic <laughs> things. Um and so I just really want it to be something from a very ground level. So um, that's sort of a project I'm working on. Um, Do you think you'll ever return to a war zone? Uh, uh, put in the, not I'm putting the cartel in a sure, slightly sure. different category, but you know, similar to the areas that you visited to write your book. Yes, I I definitely am not done with that part of my life yet. Maybe not to the same level mm-hmm. that I've I've covered in the past of, of really. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's certainly not a life. It's a lifestyle. And everything that you do has to be somehow consumed by that. And and I don't I don't know. I, I guess I tend to look at life a little bit in chapters. And I don't know that I, I, that chapter is ever going to be in, in sort of a repeat. But I definitely think my life covering war zones is not done yet. I'm very interested in I'm talking to an Australian war photographer friend of mine at the moment about um, collaborating on some products, possibly in Afghanistan, around the time that the U.S. sort of officially departs because yeah. we'd like to see what happens there. Um, so I think that will be also on my radar as well, and I, I'm curious about about that part of the world, definitely. Um, and then I think the sort of the nature of war is, is changing a little bit too. Um, again, I think the big focus is in China, um, Iran, and I don't necessarily know that they're going to be hot wars, but they're going to be sort of cold simmering wars. And, and that is, is very intriguing to me as well. Yeah. Um, I think Myanmar, Burma is also a, an interesting place that I, I've covered a little bit, but I would like to explore that a little bit more as well in, in Asia and see what um, where that develops. Do you ever worry about how much time you spend? In the shadows, in the dark. If you talk about good and evil, you know, mm-hmm. it's, as a metaphor, light and dark. You ever worry about how much time you spend in the dark? The impact it might have on you, the weight. I do. That the experiences. Yep. I mean, they, yep. It has tangible weight. It does. It does. And I guess I take. I made a decision. You know, nobody forced me to be in that situation. Nobody's forced me to to go back there or to cover assignments there. They've all been decisions that I've made. So I I take responsibility in that I've made those decisions. Um, but I do think I look back, and I guess you know, having gone to boarding school and having left Australia very young and all these things. So I've been always been a very independent person. And I never put weight on support systems to the degree that I think now that I'm in my mid thirties that I um, wish that I'd done when I was younger. So I guess you know when you're in your twenties, you're somewhat invincible, and you don't think you need help, and you don't think you need uh, you know to talk about it to to friends. And, and quite frankly, it's hard to talk about those things with people that are not in that environment. And I think that I just thought I was a little bit maybe invincible in that way. And I didn't put those support structures in place when I should have. And so now I'm looking back on it and kind of trying to work backwards a little bit. But I think I didn't, you know, I tended to go into a hole a little bit more than I should have. And I'm I'm definitely very aware of that. Mm-hmm. And now for me, it's more just being able to, how can I restore some of the support systems or what is it, what does a support system look like to me now that I think I didn't need as much when I was younger that I definitely recognize that I need now. I know that writing is cathartic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it helps me. Have you ever, or do you now, do you, talk with a professional to unload some of that weight? I have in time to time. I'm not particularly great about 
doing that on a frequent basis as I should. But I do have um, a couple of really good friends that I tend to unload a lot of that onto, where I'll talk about it a lot or I'll call. Um, but yeah, I write a lot. It's hard, and I guess this is where my stubbornness comes in to a degree. It is hard always to explain a lot. And also, I guess you don't want people who really love you to worry about you too much either. Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I've never, <laughs> I never really discussed it with my family, so to speak. You know, they often didn't even really know when I was in places um, until I came back. And then I would tell them or, you know. Uh, I'd say I was in a, you know, I was in Turkey when I was really in Syria or whatever it is. So um, I tended to shield them from that too, I think to a degree. Um, Yeah. So it definitely is a work in progress in recognizing that you do need those outlets. Uh, And at the same time, I also think that I, what helps me is, is having, knowing that I make a a conscious decision to, to do those things and that. I'm, no one's holding a gun to my head to to go to Iraq and, and report on that. They're things that I feel that are part of my purpose as a journalist in this particular echelon of my life. What do you do for hobbies in your downtime in between these journeys that you're going on? I I mean, still do my ballet. I still love my ballet. I'm a big runner. Um, I have a Harley, so which is I haven't been able to ride as much as I like because it's been uh, it's been stuck in New York and I've been traveling, but. That will be, you know, a downtime thing for me is to go on a ride. Usually I'm not really much of a group rider, but I'll go with a friend or, or often, you know, will enjoy going by myself, yep. um, you know, do a little bit of a day trip or something somewhere. So that's been been a really nice thing to have gotten into in the past. I don't know if I'll do it forever, but it's something, you know, it's been nice to get into in the past four or five years. What kind of bike do you have? I have a 883, but I really like the 48. So I'm kind of contemplating selling <laughs> so I can get a 48. But then I'm like, oh, this is an expensive hobby. Maybe I need to give it up altogether. No, but it's fun. Well, I mean, let's not do that. You, you know, <laughs> bikes maintain their value. You could swap them around a little bit. I think there's a marketplace for these type of things. Yeah. So, no, that's been fun. And that's sort of, you know, that's actually was a really fun thing I got to do in Iraq too and a lot of other places that I've gone is like steal one of those really shitty, you know, 180 whatever they are bikes um and then, I've logged a few miles on those bikes yeah yeah and then take them for take them for a ride which has kind of been fun and journey into places that you may not otherwise be able to get into so you have been on one hell of a ride yeah your experience is quite fascinating i would say you probably based on the trips that you have done you have probably more peripheral experience to combat in the cost than most people in the United States military, even in the peak kinetic years. It's it's good to see that you have uh, that you've handled it the way that you have, and it ha- you haven't become defined by it or <clears throat> been smashed under the weight of it on the shoulders. It's it's a real it's a real thing for sure. It's very very hard to describe the cost. You asked in the book, and I don't know if it was you asking this because Jocka was reading it, what is war? Mm. Was that something that you ask people? That's a running theme sort of throughout the book. I guess it's a string that ties a lot of the, the memos together. But no, they're, they're my perceptions. Okay. So taken from different situations. Yeah. So in each sort of situation, I think you can never define war as one thing or the other. And so often I would I would ask this question to myself, really. What is it in this particular situation? What is it in this particular situation? What are the little different facets that we may not fully understand? Um, and, and they can be as small as war being something that sows distrust between people. So suddenly you can't trust your neighbors, you can't trust people who are your friends. And right through from that to the much more macro picture, which war is, war is a suicide bombing, war is um, babies being killed, war is, you know, and they're the big picture, but I guess with that question, what I wanted to do was bring out the micro in this uh, the subtle aspect of what war does to to humans now that you've had some distance from it what does it mean to you now in your current headspace somebody was to ask you holly i've never been around it i don't want to be around it but you have been around it what's it like what's war war is horrific and i'm someone who who really i guess over time has come to see that it often does very little good 
you know, I think there's a lot more. Um, it should always be the extremity of an absolute last resort and never a first resort. I think I rarely see a purpose in going to war. I rarely see a point of, of US in any sort of full scale capacity. And that's not to say that you know, we can't be involved in, in some of these conflict and supporting local um, groups or supporting humanitarian concerns. But I rarely see the point of full scale war. Uh, having said that, war again I go back to war will show you the best and worst of human beings it will show you absolutely incredible things and it will show you the absolute darkness and the light as well it's a pretty damn good description probably better than I could do what's your definition of war that's tough because I have my personal experience and then the you know the grander what is war as a country War was one of the most beautiful things that I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. The clarity of decision-making and I think the ability to have an impact is hard to match. You and I could have a conversation for six hours and we could maybe change somebody's mind or set in motion for them uh, a new routine or habit that could have a a long-term impact maybe if they can see the course. But my experience in war is that you can take what you perceive to be evil at a level that you're, it har- harmonizes in your bones and you can take it off the board. Mm. The ability to have impact, the ability to make a difference, the selflessness that I saw from other people, the sacrifice that I saw for other people. I watched U.S. service members on countless occasions risk their life to run into the middle of a road to grab a kid, Mm. to shield women with their own body with incoming rounds or mortar. And they don't know these people, um, and they don't know necessarily what they believe in, but they know that those people are trapped in a situation that they can do something about it. And on the other side of that, the the depths of what humans are capable of, abuse. Um, And the abuse that rubbed me the wrong the wrongest, that's not a correct way to say that, the abuse that <clears throat> still has an impact on me, oftentimes it didn't come from the soldiers. It was from the way that the people treated themselves and their neighbors, in addition to having either Al-Qaeda or the Taliban around there, just the savagery of neighbor against neighbor and holding onto grudges generationally and seeing how that would have an impact. Um, but I... I look back on it and to me war is a beautiful, beautiful thing from the perspective of how I was able to find myself, Mm -hmm. how I was able to grow in that process. And I would never wish it on anybody. And I wish it was an option that wasn't even on the table. Uh, Very complex for Mm -hmm. sure. It also taught me um, really the value of a beautiful thing about America is the value that we do put on human life that we don't see in much of the world. And in so many of the countries I've worked in, a soldier goes, a soldier dies on the battlefield, they're dead on the battlefield. Whereas the US will risk the lives of, of 20 more soldiers to go in and find the remains of that soldier, you know, which to a lot of you know, foreign entities just look at that and think that's insane. But yeah, to they'll me, look at you like you're an idiot. Why yeah, would you do that? Why would you do that? And to me, that's you know, that's a beautiful thing about America is the value that we put on human lives. And you know, there are still people out there trying to to find remains of of uh, pilots who went down in World War Two. Yeah. And just you know, that that is what makes America an incredibly special place. I agree. Yeah, it's uh, fuck. I didn't think we'd be having this conversation today. (laughs) Very deep. Where can people find your book? Uh, You can go to Amazon and also from the D'Angelo Publications website. And it's also in Audible and Kindle as well. If you're going to listen to it on the Audible, please don't do so in your car with your kids (laughs) in the back. Unless they're age appropriate. Yes. Late teens, I would say, at best. Yeah, there are some (laughs) some heavy moments in there, definitely. but then otherwise, yeah, I have the, my link on my social media, which is Holly S. McKay, H-O-L-L-I-E, 
S M C K A Y. What's your next trip you're going on? Uh, possibly Africa next month. Kind of working on a few things there to see what pans out uh, there. Um, if not, I was supposed to be in India next week, but I decided to postpone that one because of the situation there. And, and There's yeah, COVID yeah, hotspot right COVID now. COVID hotspot. And I just didn't think that it was going to be worth getting the material that I needed to get. So um, definitely when that situation settles down, I'd like to get back there. Um, and also I'd like to get back to Pakistan too. There's some stuff I'm working on there. Um, I'm very passionate about the Dr. Afridi case that's still ongoing there and and talking to his uh, his lawyer and he is obviously... I'm not familiar with that at all. What's going on there? So he's the doctor that uh, went to the Bin Laden compound and got swabs that the CIA then used to uh, find bin, or to verify bin Laden's uh, location. Pre-operation. Pre-operation. Yeah. So he was thrown in. Um, what well, Basically, in a nutshell, uh, you know, Panetta and a bunch of people came out after that operation and were very quick to relay the details publicly before the doctor, you know, he was offered to be able to leave. My understanding is that he was offered to be able to leave, but decided, oh, you know, no one's going to know, or he didn't really know who he was working for. It was just taking money. Yeah. Um, and so of course the, the Pakistanis were very upset about what had happened. They nabbed him. Um, they didn't charge him, you know, with, with treason or terrorism, but they charged him with a, a bullshit, uh, part of being part of a terrorist group, um, which he wasn't. And so he has been spent the last decade wasting away in a jail, being abused every day. He's been on hunger strikes. His family has to move to a different location every other week because the radicals want to get them um, because they're so angry about it. And I just think it's a real shame and it's a real stain on the United States that we had this this doctor that, um, you know, did a great service to us and he is, you know, sitting in a jail somewhere and yeah. he's been forgotten and that's something I've I've tried to bring up as much as I can. I've brought it up in different interviews that I've done with the foreign minister and people over there and just it's like butting your head against a wall. I bring it up with the State Department, you know, whatever opportunity I can and I just it's one thing I don't want to forget about because this guy is just he's you know, he's on his death row and he's a twenty three year sentence or something. Like I said, I think near the beginning, the United States, specifically the DOD or the military, is great at a, at a few things. Tying up all the loose ends, probably not one of the ones that they're the best at, yeah. for sure. That and they admit they so, fucked up on this. They admit yeah. it openly and we're like, we bring this up in high-level discussions. We'll keep going, do more. Yeah. You know, there's aid. There's other things we can do to, with, <laughs> to push for this. And it's very politically charged. Yeah, I can imagine that it definitely would be. Wow. So you have no intention of slowing down at all. I can respect that immensely, yeah. actually. Yeah. People tell me that I should, well, they used to tell me I've changed my hobbies, like much more safe hobbies now. But they say, well, you're crazy. Why do you do that stuff? I'm like, I don't know. It's what I'm called to do. So mm -hmm. I can totally understand that from that perspective. Yeah. And I'm all about a good story. And to me, a good story and, and good writing isn't isn't necessarily always about being in a war zone or a crazy place. I'm, I'm very, you know, deeply uh, curious about things that, you know, everyday things here as well. And I think there are a lot of great stories to be told, you know, pretty much on your back door. So I think, you know, for people that are, are wanting to do that work, I would suggest, you know, firstly stop and just learn how to tell a great story. And then that doesn't have to be running to the other side of the world uh, where there's bombs falling. It can be, you know, going to talk to your 99-year-old neighbor and, and asking them what life was like in, you know, 1945. Or, you know, there are just ways of, of we, we gravitate to great stories. And I think that's something that you know that's an art that we've lost a little bit of and I think everybody wants to sort of think that they can tell a story and da 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 but I think we've lost that art of just what it is just to tell a story yeah and I think I took a lot of weight off my own shoulders when I, I used to get very frustrated you know you go and you report these things and nothing changes and then once you take that sort of hubris away and say that's not what my job is my job is not to go in and and of course, you want to have an impact, but that's not my job. Whether I have an impact or not, my job is to tell the story as best I can. And I think once I removed myself from that situation, I was able to be much more free with the pen and just, just tell it without expectation. I think change will come from the stories. I mean that like in a grander perspective because it has to be – it has to see the light of day for the mm. change to occur. It's probably not a timeline – 
most often that people don't have the tolerance for. But I think you have to have one to have the other. I think it's very important work. Thank you. Closing thoughts by Holly. I'll get you guys out of here so you can enjoy what apparently is gale force winds in Montana. All right. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing about Montana, and I, I'm not a, a native people. Calm down. They say if you don't like the weather in Montana, wait five minutes. I've it, th- That's actually the first time I've said that, but I have heard other people say it a lot. Right. I think Montana is one of the most stunning states in the country. I think you mean Wyoming. Yeah. That's yeah. what I've been told to say. Well, that's a, you know that's a John Steinbeck <laughs> quote where he says something to the degree of you know Wyoming is beautiful but Montana is heavenly or something to that degree. I think you mean Idaho. Yeah. Oh, Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> that's a uh, Or Colorado perhaps. It's hard to say. Colorado perhaps. Perhaps we could uh but no, Montana is pretty stunning. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come up here. Um <sighs> Thank you for putting yourself out there and going to these places and taking the time to invest in what other people around the world are going through. Like I said, I think the stories have to be told for there to be change. And far too many people have their head buried in the sand. So maybe they'll listen to you more than they'll listen to me. I hope so. I hope, and I hope that you know the memos are pretty diverse. So I hope that you know, if something gets a little heavy, it's okay. You can sort of turn the page and find a lighter one. And I hope don't there's... do that. Go right through that. Yeah, it needs yeah. to be heavy sometimes. I know it does. Yeah. It does, and that's that's the thing about, um, I guess, war writing for me is there's no exaggeration needed. It can be raw as um, raw as possible, and I hope that in doing that, it gives people a deeper sense. I didn't I didn't want to sanitize anything. I think that's the only way you can do justice. Mm. Awesome. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Andy. Thank you again to Kalo for supporting this episode of the podcast. Kalo silicone rings are great no matter how active you are. Get 20% off at Kalo.com slash cleared hot. Check them out. That's Kalo, Quebec, Alpha, Lima, Oscar dot com slash cleared hot. And also thank you to Babbel for supporting the podcast right now. When you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That is six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Code CLEAREDHOT for an extra three months for free. Babbel, language for life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and Share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero-star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com. And there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is... Fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about T-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you can tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, see you.